Hello and welcome to the Aquinas Twitch channel, esports number one. Today we have you, we have for you some more College League of Legends. My name is Blue Jay, and with me today I have armor class known as AC. How are you doing, buddy? Doing great, you know, having a having a good Michigan Saturday. The sun's shining over here in West Michigan, and we're about to have a great, you know, series best of three here of Aquinas College versus University of Iowa. Yep, we are excited to get this one started. We're still stuck in the lobby, so we'll have some more analysis, some more drafting, and some more League of Legends for you here soon. But what's the rundown for our league right now? So right now, if we're looking at the C law, we are currently seeing our AQ Saints at a three and one record. If we're looking to make those playoffs, we're looking at the five one, and that's going to have to that that's a requirement now. You know, it's either six zero or five one. AQ is going to have to pull these next two games out. And, you know, with how they've been playing, I think they have a good shot of doing it. Yeah, AQ has been on fire lately. It's been so exciting to watch. I get to see a little bit of, of different teams in the college scene facing off. And AQ is definitely probably one of my favorites. Uh, you know, Obi Toppin in the jungle has been popping off. I mean, Honestly, uh, he feels like the main carrier of this team, just set up a lot of plays. But, you know, one of the underrated things that we talked about last stream was Tybro in the support position like he's really been growing as a player and been you know just setting up a ton of these plays yeah one of the last matches that we saw we did see the pjr double zero he was on the ezreal and he was going very aggressive with the you know with the arcane shifts and all that and tybro was just on the alistar and he had the hex flash over Baron Walls, and he was following that Ezreal across the map, keeping his ADC safe, and it was just fantastic play. And we're actually about to transition now over on into the draft. Yep, and, you know, let's not discount some of these other players, but, in fact, we did have double zero transition over to Masters here this week, so big shout-out to Paul over here on, on AQ's. Um, however, we are jumping into draft, counting down. We do have Grundle Jelly in the top lane for University for Iowa. Dingle Bingus in the jungle. Uh, Katonoa in the mid lane. I am the Awesome 10 in the bot lane with no Chiji over here as the support. So they're going to take Alistar off the table. We're not going to see Tybro pick up his signature cow here this game, but we'll see what they choose to adapt with because there's still a lot of supports up. You know, typically we, we might see a, a Rel or maybe a Leona. Those two seem to be, you know, the higher priority picks, especially with Alistar taking off. Yeah, and I think that Alistar ban really shows how afraid these teams need to be of this bot lane duo here. You know, PGR00 may have just hit Masters, but they're targeting the support pool. They understand that even though he only has a gold two border behind his name, Tybro is in fact a very impactful player in these matchups. And especially in these late game team fights, he finds the angles needed to get the ball rolling for his team to just snowball on through. Yep, and we're not surprised with some of these other bands coming through. We have Udir taken off the table. Uh, probably one of still the number one pick, I would say, in the jungle. We did have a few XB changes, but um, it's not as bad as people would, would like to say. I mean, you're still hitting level four off that full clear. It's just if you respond a lot more to the plays around the map, you can pick up some bonus XB and gold uh, coming out from those plays coming out of the lane. However, we have Seraphine take it off, which is still a big nuisance on the Rift. I don't think... We're ever going to see that idol onto Summoner's Rift here as we have 280 carry bands coming out for the last two for University of Iowa, just as uh, you were talking about. Yeah, kind of surprising they did take away the Kais right here. You know, they are blue side, and Kais has been a very prominent first pick ADC. Very dominant, especially with the uh, versatility of that Kraken Slayer or Gale Force. And they're actually going to grab the Senna here for the first pick. And I like this Senna. Um, it can be paired well with so many different champions. Right now we're seeing kind of the resurgence of the Farm Kench, uh, which is kind of the new name. We don't have Fasting Senna anymore. It's really support Senna, you know, with that Spectral Sickle, and then the Farm Kench in the bot lane. However, you could still pick up a lot of different melee champions in the bot lane, or even go for your own AD carry, though that leaves you very, very squishy. And as we've seen, if you've been watching the LCS, the LPL, and hopefully the LEC here soon, is we're seeing a lot more Kane in the jungle, right? Against some of those squishier members, you know, gets that lethality, one shots the back line. But instead, we're going to see Set picked up here for AQ, a big flex pick. I think that can still go in the jungle. Not as effective as earlier, but with camps being less, you don't have to farm as heavily and you can gank like crazy. So we'll see where that one ends up as we have the countdown for the second pick for AQ coming out of 2-1. And it's going to be the Tristana. 
Yeah, I actually think these are two very brilliant picks coming out from AQ here. Arguably with Set, you know, you can get the Turbo Chem take in the jungle so he can chase down members. He's still a very viable top laner with that Stride Breaker. And, you know, if you were playing last season, you did know that Set was able to mid lane against a lot of these mages. And, of course, if you can play a mid, jungle, and top, might as well be able to put him in the support role. And with this Tristana, we've actually been seeing a lot of Tristana's mid, at least I have, in solo queue. Yeah, I just not can still be flexed around, but it is going to be the Ivern over here for the University of Iowa. And that was one uh, I was looking over some of these players and I didn't notice too much, too much, you know, specials coming out of there. But the Ivern for Dingo Bingus actually was something that I had my eye on. I didn't really expect to see it picked up here, but they so far are looking at a, a three person support team. Although, you know, Senna does do damage. She still has, you know, that that early game presence into the later stages when she stacks up those souls. But now you have the Senna, Ivern, and Nami over here. That's a lot of healing, a little bit of shields and, and quite a bit of lockdown, but they're going to be so squishy. So if AQ can pick up some of these uh, champions that burst them out, it could be really, really deadly for the University of Iowa. So far, they're hovering Mundo, and though we don't typically like to talk about hovers, that is an up-and-coming champion. Instead, it's going to be the Volibear locked in, probably for Obi Toppin in the jungle as he, he took this one out, you know, the last series. Yeah. He was absolutely destructive, able to use that Stormbringer and the cur the Turbo Chem Tank to just get into the back line of these enemy teams. And with looking at how they are now, you know, Iowa has three very squishy back line champions. If this set and Volibear are going to get onto him, it is going to be a destructive force. And they're actually going to take the Olaf away. Kind of surprising, you know, the Volibear and the set in my predictions right now are probably going to be their top and their jungle side at the moment. And we do see the Cho'Gath ban, so they are clinching the top lane a little bit here from AQ. Yep, I think that's solid. I mean, you, it, that would give, Cho'Gath especially would give them that big tank in the top side of the map that allows them to weather up some of those storms because with all these healing and shields, typically you're looking at some longer team fights, right? That's where a lot of your power comes through. You'll see, you know, that Moonstone, Staff of Flowing Water, but that procs periodically. It doesn't happen with all the instances of damage. So you really have to keep these uh, these fights going in as actually the cannon probably picked up for Fate's Call in the top lane. So we should see that set either in the mid lane or support. We're still not quite sure where it's going to be going, but the Cassiopeia does get more consistent damage over on the other side for the University of Iowa. And with that Miasma and that kiting ability, you can really prolong some of these fights, which is kind of seeming like their game plan. But back to your point over to the Volibear, right, with that Stormbringer and also with the Rolling Thunder on his Q when he's charging right at you for that stun. If he gets interrupted with that, you can just, you know, reset it. He becomes enraged, gets that cooldown right back. And one of the underrated parts of Stormbringer that I don't think enough people talk about is that you become unstoppable, right? You can instantly, you know, move away from some of those CC coming through. So, you know, that, that petrifying gaze from Cassiopeia means nothing. The waves mean nothing from Nami. You can't be rooted up from the Ivern. You can't be, you know, embraced by the Senna. So you can really jump into the back line. There's not a lot they can do. They're very, very immobile. But in fact... It's the Oriana for the mid laner, so it is going to be support set. Yeah, I think Iowa here is going to have to be very careful. They have the Aatrox who has to get in to land, you know, the Qs. He has the red marks that increase the healing that he receives. You know, E is the passive on it. It has the uh, the vamp life. And Set is just going to be able to bring that frontline carry into the backline and mix them up together. Iowa's going to have to be very careful with their positioning here. They have the shields and heals as well as disrupts, but... If AQ can get on them with Ken and Oriana and the Stormbringer from Volibear, that is a lot of damage coming out. Yeah, University of Iowa definitely has the the harder composition to pull off, right? I mean, they don't really have a frontliner Aatrox. I mean, he can get those healings when he, you know, brings in those those Qs and the dashes and has that healing from his E, but excuse me, but for the most part he's he's not all that tanky uh, in, in reality right? he has to do damage he's more of those drain tanks like the more he does damage the more he's healing that that leaves his health pool up but he doesn't typically build some of those those bigger items that are going to help you uh last in some of these fights you're really depending on the the ivern senna and nami to really top you off but aquinas has some really really good burst damage which is really really effective against some of those prolonged fights right because if you're able to just burst someone before they can be healed and shielded and getting out then you pretty much already won the team fight yeah <clears throat> we, we keep talking about it 
Iowa has to be so very careful, especially if they lose the lead on this early game here. I mean, they have Senna and they have Cassiopeia and Aatrox. Those are champions that are going to need two, three items, you know, to come online and be very powerful and dominant in these team fights. If they start losing that edge, it's going to be a really rough time. Aatrox needs that Gore Drinker. And he's going to have to build these tank stats to survive these fights. Because if he gets engaged on Tristana, Oriana, Volibear, they can easily pop him. He has no, you know, no shielding and his dash is so short he can't get away from him. Yeah, let's you know, let's talk about this Tristana a little bit more because I think we've been seeing this rise a little bit all across the world. We've seen a few bands over in the LEC for different, you know, members who are who are playing it over there. Even in the LCS it got banned a few times against Immortals, and I think it's just one of those champions that has been flying under the radar as Kind of an abusive laner, to be honest. I mean, you can jump right onto this Senna. I think that's typically what you see it picked against is some of these immobile champions like Senna who don't have the, the big burst early here to counter out, you know, this Tristana. And it's paired with a set who, you know, is, you have to assume it's taking, you know, like maybe a, a, the Hex Flash going to be flashing all over the place, getting in your face, wanting to brawl. The Tristana follows up very, very effectively with, you know, that explosive... Um, charge and, and just building that up and stacking that damage so this could be very very difficult for the university of iowa here early even in the laning phases i think they have you know counter picks almost pretty much across the board they just weren't able to figure out where that set was going or you know where that follow bear was so they kind of wasted a few bands you know with that olaf and aquinas just putting on a master class for some of this drafting phase i assume for the moment, it comes down to execution, but right now I'm really liking what AQ has. Oh, for sure. Yeah, they definitely were able to play 3D chess here in this game of checkers. Um, but going back on that Tristana point, something that you were talking about with the explosive charge and the jump, that rocket jump does apply, you know, an increase on the stacks on that explosive charge. And Tristana's nowadays are running Halo Blades. Halo Blades mixed with her Q, which is rapid fire, is just another, you know, an attack speed steroid on top of an attack st speed steroid. That explosive charge is going to go off very very quickly and if that's on nami or senna they are very squishy early on champions so i'm really looking to see aq here kind of put early pressure on this bot lane yeah and there's there's two ways to kind of counter that rocket jump right is either you have that instant cc while she's in the air or you just kill her right away well here's the deal university of iowa doesn't have either of those options right the nami has to land that bubble which is very telegraphed the senna uh, the last embrace there takes a while to activate and really the only instant cc you have is that petrifying gaze for the cassiopeia and we're assuming that tristan is not going to be jumping right in the face of some of these members i mean devil zero is very very good on his 80 carry so i have confidence in in him and knowing what he's about and when to go in he's been showing a a, a lot of mastery over so many different champions. You talk about the Ezreal with the Arcane Shifts dashing into these fights. We'll see if you can have the same effect with this on this Tristana as we're jumping onto the Rift here for match one of University of Iowa versus Aquinas Esports. Yeah, onto the Rift here. We'll have to see. We are going to get our standings up real quick here, and they are going to be moving out of the fountain here. We're going to probably be seeing... I, you know, I really hope AQ is going to put pressure on early here and maybe look for that invade early on. We are seeing the five point kind of coming out here. You can see the early setup with how positioning is from Iowa. But yeah, I really want to see some very early aggression here coming out from AQ. Yep, and we don't see anything too different with some of these rune choices, right? It's, you know, phase rush set, which is similar to the Alistar, right? You go in. Um, you can take that Nimbus Cloak, and you take that Hex Flash, you're able to move at the speed of light, just jumping around, flashing around with that channel time. So, very, very effective. Uh, first strike of the game is Infernal, though. That can be a really big point of contestation here early. Typically, people like to fight over that Dragons, and especially one that's going to be boosting the damage, which in turn is going to be boosting the healing and shielding from University of Iowa. could prove, you know, a, a very deadly point against AQ, so they need to be very careful about where they're setting up some of the jungle pathing. However, it looks like Obi Toppin is going to be starting at the red buff, and we'll have no idea what Dingle Bingus does on the Ivern as he has a million different options he can choose from. Yeah, Ivern, a very unique champion when it comes to the jungle role. He doesn't need a leash. He's able to just use his passive, which sacrifices some health and some mana, and he begins a countdown on the camp. He's able to leave and go do other camps, and when that countdown timer is up, he can just click on the camp, and he gains the experience that he would have normally for killing the camp itself. Um... When it comes to a jungle like that, a strategy that's pretty popular was just starting your buff and going immediately over. You would start Q, you're able to dash over walls with it, and you would actually start that countdown timer. And if you smite, the the timer itself goes off instantly. So a lot of Ivorns have had very good luck with 
stealing those objectives early and counter jungling very early on. Uh, it doesn't look like he was able to do that this time, especially with the red buff start. That did come out from Obi Top in here. And like I said, I wanted to see that early aggression. He is going to be able to path down on his way through these camps. Yep, so, so far they're starting on the same side. And, you know, actually they had to place the little ward there in the almost by the river there in that little bush. So they were going to be able to see that Ivern running through unless he ran all the way through the bot side of the map. But so far, nothing too special. A little bit of a CS lead here in the mid lane. But Cassiopeia is kind of known to do that once you land, you know, the, those uh, blasts and you hit that Twin Fangs. As you can see right there, just quick, very, you know, very, very quick trades and just is able to zoom away on her little snaky snakes with that phase rush. So... Really, just a little bit of farming. We'll see where Obi Toppin's going to be ending up on this if he wants to make a play. Not really sure they want to be diving here in, in this bot lane. I don't think Full of Bear really has a great amount of dive potential. But with the set, you can, right, you stack that grit and that, you know, the the the, the haymaker there, and you can kind of survive some of these these pokings and and uh, tower dives. Yeah, we're also kind of see Dingle Bingus. He is sitting up top lane here. Iowa top laner is pushed in a bit and he is going to have to walk away they were you know kind of sitting in the tri brush really waiting to see if they can get an advantage on that top lane and we talked about it earlier aatrox is going to need two three items to come online to be a monster in these team fights and fate's call doing a very very good job at keeping the wave kind of closer to his turret and staying safe from from this early aggression yeah, and we've seen that matchup before for Fate's Call, right? He usually gets a few of these counter picks, like the cannon. He likes to play some of these range <laughs> matchups. As we see Obi Top and Zoom in here in the mid lane, the flash away, but he lands the stun. The lightning comes down, and that's first blood for Stevenator here in the mid lane. Fantastic. That's what we wanted to see from AQ. The early aggression. <laughs> Obi Toppin threw down the Storm's Call, was able to just run in, and Cassiopeia could not get away, Use the flash, that's a big cooldown, and that's the teleport coming out, all she was able to do was buy, you know, get that Doran's Ring going as well, and now Stevenator has got that first blood gold in him, and they're going to be able to do a repeat like that, the only summoner that was used was the Cassiopeia's. Yeah, just the flash for the Cassio, I mean... Obi Toppin didn't even have to burn his. Stevenator didn't have to burn his. The Maestro doesn't land. Is actually the flash coming in from Obi Toppin. Good thing he saved that one. Is that Storm's Call? It's coming in clutch, and Obi Toppin takes another one down. Obi Toppin is dominating this early game already. Getting a kill mid lane. Getting the kill in top lane. AQ is beginning to show that early aggression we wanted to see. Very impactful Volibear player, and I cannot wait until he gets this chem tank. Yeah, it's going to be deadly when that comes online. You can see teleport burned for both the laners for Iowa. So they're going to be trying to get back to this lane. However, it doesn't feel too good for this Aatrox already down to half health. But if he's able to pick this one up, that wave could freeze. It's not really going to be bouncing with that, you know, that stacked wave. Um, uh, but, you know, Kuro was able to, to teleport back in. Now, Stevenator caught up with that root color. Does have the flash. It's going to be flashing away. Not quite enough damage for those twin fangs. Like you said, only has the, the Doran's ring and the uh, the, the stacking mana item, excuse me, as the Maestro comes down against Obi Top, and he's just running through. Actually, here we go, TP coming out from AQ, and now look who's on the wrong side of the fight, and Steven Ayer picks up his second kill of the match as more scuffles in the jungle, but it looks like the rest of the team's able to scoot out. AQ is just playing so aggressive already. It is 5.30, and they have already secured three kills, two of them going onto this Orianna, and that was a teleport that did come out from Fate's Call on the top lane here. And they're getting this first dragon. Very, very well executed play there. They did get the flash out from Ivern, and I'm excited to see what this next is going to be. We are seeing Cloud Drake, so that means we are going to see a Mountain or Ocean Soul. Both are very good win cons, and... Dragon control is going to be very important in this game. Yep, so far with this early lead to AQ it was pretty devastating for the University of Iowa. But having all this gold on, on Stevenator on this Orianna, which was that big burst damage with that shockwave, was exactly what we said Iowa had to look out for. This, So this is kind of looking at worst case scenario. And you know what? I'm really excited to see this Volo Bear man. I, a lot of people have been memeing that he's kind of dead in the jungle, but... You think about it, man. It's He has such great utility. He has early game damage. He can farm like crazy with his passive and that sustain coming out from the mob. So, I mean, he can he can go back, take camps if he needs to, but his ganking is so effective. You can see him with that press the attack, proccing that, that storm color coming down. Just huge burst damage. As long as there's a little bit of follow-up from, from his laner, he can pretty much take down anywhere he wants. So, 
really love seeing this adaptation coming from Obi Toppin. I would love to see this Volo Bear more, as we're already seeing 0 3. You have, you know, a one and a half gold lead, and, and already that first dragon picked up, and it's only, you know, Seven minutes into the game, so huge win for AQ so far here early. We'll see if they can transition this out, but University of Iowa isn't out of the game yet. They still have a lot of tools to work with, if they can get that control that you were talking about, AC. Yeah, and it's something I think is kind of an undervalued combo right now. Oriana Volibear is a very good pairing, especially considering that, as you talked about, the Volibear Stormbringer, it does make him unstoppable. This Oriana's getting ahead is able to give a speed boost to Volibear on top of that turbo chem tank and when that stormbringer comes out it is just command dissonance on everybody around that volley bear it is going to be absolutely destructive as a hula hoop for, for a bear <laughs> <laughs> it really is so aq really needs to get you know iowa all grouped up and then pull down the combo with you talk about the full bear but we haven't even you know seen the set pop off yet a really good showstopper can bring Everyone into the middle, slow them all down, hits the face breaker, stuns them all up, and then you have a shockwave and you have the full bear on top and you even have the, the slicing maelstrom coming out of this cannon. Like, there's so many tools that we haven't seen, and, and maybe we will, maybe we won't. If they keep running over these lanes, we might not even get there. But already we're seeing Tybro in the jungle establishing some, some vision and getting a little bit of an invade. Rush those Moby Boots to get around the map here. Looks like they're going to be taking away this red buff here with, uh, with double zero. They just said, we don't need to be in the lane, we just need to get these camps. But uh, Dingle Bingo's even further behind us. They might be looking for him here. Yeah, he Rocking doesn't have flash. Dingle Bingo's. You know, Face Breaker comes through. Special Charge is coming through. But the Petrifying Gaze does stun them up. He has those shields. He's barely walking away and just managed to scrape by. Yeah, Steven A was trying to be a little reserved there. He had the command dissonance, but he wanted to make sure that, you know, PJR could get some gold into him. And we're seeing Steven A now trading with Cassiope here. The Twin Fangs coming out and doing a lot of damage. Cassiope does have good sustain coming out from there. Steven A not enough, but he's able to push this wave. Did have the Corrupting Potion stacks ready on hand. Saving that shockwave to, to push in this mid lane. Remember, this Cassio doesn't have teleport. Had to burn it very, very early. As you know, see Obi Toppin maybe waiting around the wings for a dive. Has that, that Stormbringer that you were talking about that can make, you know, the, the towers just completely disabled. So they were looking for it, but Kodo just barely able to back right on time as the Rift Herald goes down. That's even more gold for this Oriana. Ooh, this jungle mid combo is running. They are taking the bank and just stealing it away. If you've seen Fast and the Furious with the cars, they're just driving that vault away and running away with this game already. They are so wealthy in comparison to their counterparts. Both up in CS, both have kill participation and kills themselves. They are going to be the two driving forces of this game right now. We do see that Tybro here on set does have the Moby boots, but right now, I don't think he even he could catch up to this Volley Bear. <laughs> Not at all. He will get that turbo can take here soon. I mean, there is less gold, less XP in the jungle, which is why you see him ganking so much. But, you know, he has a lot of these components. He still needs to pick up a, a little bit more. But he's being, you know, he's feeling very, very confident in this very Level 7 compared to the level 5. Now level 6 for Dingle Bingus here. So he's still up ahead. But Dingle Bingus is really, really far behind. And, and typically what you saw, Ivern, that's okay, right? I mean, you're, you're really banking off of some of your item advantages since support items are so cheap. And Ivern's able to... to pick those up as, uh, you know, the Moonstone, but he only has the Ionian Boots, a Ruby Crystal, and the Fairy Charm so far, compared to, you know, the Bomby Center on this Volo Bear has the Mercury Treads, which is so effective versus the other team, so he's not in a great place right now, I gotta say. Yeah, and you were talking about how the support items are rather cheap. If my memory serves, Moonstone Renewer is only about a 2,500 gold cost item compared to, you know, these 3,000 gold cost tanks, so it's okay to be down a little bit here. Trying his best, and we are seeing now, right as Cloud Drake has respawned, we are seeing AQ put pressure on, and we do have Tybro and Obi Toppin on the Drake at the moment. Fate's call coming down into the river, maybe seeing if there was going to be a team fight happening. TPs are still not quite up for Iowa, as we saw Cassio actually TP'd into the mid lane, so another TP gone, not going to be able to make a, a very big play, but. Cloud Drake does go down. It looks like Fate Skull is going pretty much all in on this Aatrox, but he just got stunned up, pushed away. Now the Slicing Maelstrom comes up, but they're just going to be able to get out as Dingle Bingus is hovering on the top side. But look at that. It's going to be Ocean Drake here on the Rift as Fate's Call is maybe going in 2v1 as the Root Caller does land. They're able to dash over with that one. Daisy is summoned under the tower. Daisy is soaking up some of this damage. In fact, it goes over to Ivern. Fate's Call has to flash away. He's getting so, so low if they're able to finish this one out as they finally do. And Dinkabuyus takes that kill as we have more scuffles in the bot lane. 
Yeah, that Daisy, the entire time Aatrox was wailing onto Fate Skull here, was just able to keep going with the aggression. And that is going to be the Stormbringer followed by, by the engaged face smack against the two. But that is going to be a kill going on to Senna here. We're getting trades across the map right now. Iowa still showing signs of life here. They're only down by about 2.5k. We'll have to see. We do have Ocean Soul this map. And I want to see Iowa make sure they're looking at it and trying to get that early pressure onto it because they're going to need that Ocean Soul if they're going to live out this game. Yeah, and the mid lane tower does go down while all the rest of that was going on. But think about it. This bot lane is soon to follow as well as Double Zero is trying to put the final shots here. But Rucolar will miss as Dingle Bingus is here in the bot side of the map. But think about all that plate money and who it's going to. Right, it's. I mean, it is split up between Obi Toppin, but he's really the big engaged tank. So you really need to get very, very beefy. But Double Zero and Stevenator are the recipients of all this plate money, and so they're being huge. Even though the CS is, you know, quite ahead, you know, 15 and 10 respectively for for Stevenator and Double Zero against their lane counterparts, they just have so much money in the back pockets. And if they're able to snowball some of this lead, there's very little that Iowa can do in this match. So I'm not going to count them out yet. I mean, like you said, it's only three. You know. 3,300 3, gold up so far, but all these objectives going AQ's way is really kind of spelling out the end. Yeah, they already have, you know, the one plate from top side. They got the entirety of mid lane tier one turret and tier one bot lane turret is just about to go down. And we are seeing the mythic items now coming out for PJR00 and Stevenator. You know, they're hitting that, that very potent power spike here in this early game. We'll just have to see how they use it. Excited to see this one take off as Stephen Air's level 11 here. Highest in the game. If we had an XP graph, you could see he's pretty far ahead as Koto's just been getting caught a few times. Has been ganked over by OP Top. And now Stephen Air over here on this red buff spots out Dingle Bingus. But the bot lane tower will finally go down for AQ. We'll see what they choose to transition to. Or they could just honestly leave some of these lanes, right? They have three winning lanes respectively, although Fate's Call has, has gone down and, and even against Aatrox, that matchup is really, really good. And keeping the Aatrox in lane where, you know, he really is that, that big tank in this game, the drain tank. If, if he's not here, as actually the rock jump comes through, but that's in the middle of three members as Double Zero has to get out. Race coming through, but a huge shockwave from Steven here is going to turn this around. One already going his way as the Nami goes down. Looks like the Senna is soon to follow, and Ivern here might go down as Rocket Jump coming through. The ultimate doesn't finish him off. Double Zero has to flash away, and he, in fact, gets taken down by the Ivern. That's a double kill for this jungler. You know, two kills on the support jungle. Most people probably not too excited about that, considering Cassio and Aatrox were moving down there. Uh, kind of a, you know, a missed opportunity there coming out from AQ. Stevenator was able to get the two kills, no problem, and tried to back out. PGR did jump in, though, after the Ivern, but just did not have the damage output to match the shielding that he was able to do. Yep, the TP comes through for the Aatrox there, or maybe just walk down. A... Screen's a little blurry, just streaming a little bit, but that does leave Fate's Call here in the top lane to take down this last outer turret for Iowa, and... This next Drake is coming up in about a minute, and Fate Skull will be able to respond to this as he has no reason to stay in the top side as the Rift Herald's also being taken by Obi Toppin. So again, AQ just getting objective after objective. And like you said, those kills all went over to the Ivern. Does have that Moonstone. Seems to be feeling pretty good in these fights as I was going to be responding. They have the numbers here. Rootcaller does land into the cannon. He's being stunned up over here. Twin Fangs to chase him down. Sped up by that phase rush as... Railgun comes through, but doesn't land, and Fate Skull's going to be able to sneak out of this, so they're probably going to lose this Rift Herald, but they could set up for this Drake and put them on soul point. So they're just going to be running over here to the mid lane. Uh, currently can't hear you, AC, so maybe they can talk to you on stream, but I'm there not currently hearing you right now, so... Yep, my bad. Yeah, no, uh, that rift reset, and they were going to have to quickly check their priority list here, and now they're starting to move towards this dragon. Uh, no problem, AC. You see that all the time in the, <laughs> the LPL and LCK. Actually, if you've ever watched some of their streams, they uh -huh. have a ton of audio issues. So <laughs> this is nothing new for some of our viewers. In fact, it's more professional experience, let's say, is that Drake will go down to AQ here, and now they're on soul point at 16 minutes. This can be a very, very early ocean soul if they're able to pick this one up, and... 
if the other team is able to to you know sustain some of these fights elongate them then that's going to play right into aq's hands i mean they don't mind if they have the ocean so the longer the fight goes the more damage they're going to get through and they're not gonna they're not gonna be sweating here in this game yeah kind of curious about iowa's call there you know they they peeled off the Rift Herald, they stopped AQ from getting it, and they moved down into that red side jungle as a team, as a full five-man force, and they just let the Ocean Dragon be taken. I think they're really worried about the damage that's going to come out from this Orianna. Yeah, they, they moved over. They didn't even take the Rift Herald, right? Like, they contested that objective, they pushed them out, but then they didn't get anything for it. They just went back to their waves, so it just feels like they're giving... They're giving AQ more and more room to grow and take some of these objectives. And at some point, you just got to make a stand because they're slowly bleeding out in this game. And AQ is slowly taking more advantages as this goes through his face. Go pushed up to the top side. Now actually down a little bit in, in CS, but he did roam quite a bit there. And, and it's been pressuring out, especially when you talk about that Rift Herald push. He got pushed out of that lane. But 4-1-0 and zero for Stevenator. He has a huge Orianna at this point. Should be, you know, breaking out uh, that Archangel Staff pretty soon. But he's already feeling himself on this pick. Glad to see him pick that one up as the chem tank already completed for the Volibear. Mythics, all for the side for, for each of these champions here. Except for our supports, you know, our, our wee little supports don't get much gold in these games anymore. So they kind of just have to make do with what they got us. The Rift Herald is going to be taken down by AQ a few minutes later. Yeah, it's kind of looking like Tybro is actually neglecting going for a Mythic right away. Instead, he's probably going to be picking up that Dead Demand plate. As we do see, you know, the Chain Vest and the the Winged... The winged oh my god, I always forget the name of them. <laughs> But it's like a wing plate or something. I don't remember exactly. We're looking at the winged moon plate very close. But ah. <laughs> so close. But he is going for that dead man's plate. The only damage really being from the Senna Aatrox and the Cassio. You know, 2 AD versus the 1 AP. And he is looking to, you know, press the gas pedal here and get into these team fights as quick as he can. I just want to call attention again. This is Ocean Soul. The, the way Ocean Soul works is when you deal damage to an enemy champion... You restore a flat 180 plus percentages of your attack damage, ability power, and your bonus health over the next three seconds. That's a lot of healing that can come out, especially for these bigger forces like Set and the Volley Bear. If they're able to sit in these team fights and just constantly deal damage, they're going to be regenerating through these fights. And even though we have the Cassio and Senna, you know, Senna does go the Kraken Slayer, which does help apply with the Q, but. That's going to be a lot of health bar to get through. Yeah, and AQ can just sit pretty here. They can just wait for this next Drake. It spawns in two minutes, and you know that pretty much Iowa has to contest at this point because you talked about all the advantages that the Ocean Soul brings, and AQ is slowly smothering out Iowa. They're going to be taking away that red buff. You have, you have the Cassiopeia just sitting in the bot lane, and... What they do have for Iowa, though, is some pretty good wave clear, right? They have that ranged advantage, so if you don't have Baron buff, it can be pretty difficult to push in some of these waves. Aatrox has some really good AoE, and he's always in range of maybe dashing into this cannon to get through, and even the Senna can be, you know, doing that piercing darkness on her Q, which can damage some of these, these minions, get them through, so... There's a lot of AoE abilities from the side of Iowa to, like I said, manage these waves. So AQ really needs to wait here as the Baron does spawn. They're going to be their next focus. is probably going to be this Ocean Drake. But then they can easily contest this, this Baron, take that one up. And that's really where we might see the lead coming through. And Stevenator is going to be uh, getting aggressed on by this Ivan, but he has to flash away. The Face Breaker coming in, stunning up two members. Stevenator dropping very, very low as he's burning. He's burning. The Aatrox is here. Teleport. He does shut down Stevenator. The slicing maelstrom's coming through, but he's not in range of anybody. As now he's sitting in the middle of all five members. The Miasma's taken up, and Senna's going to claim that kill. Now two, one, and five. And I was in a prime position to contest this Drake. Set up some vision. You have a minute left. Maybe reset. Get those wards down and see AQ coming. This is where they need to be on the map at this moment. Yeah, very good opportunity there coming out from Iowa. <clears throat> AQ kind of a little taken back there. They had people on reset timers, and Stevenator was pushed up past that try brush there in the bot lane and did get caught out by the entirety of University of Iowa. And now we see there's 25 seconds left until this Ocean Drake spawns. And we are just now seeing Stevenator come up, and that is going to be the TP coming out here from both him and... Uh, Katona, Kanade, the Cassio here. And now it's going to be a battle for vision. 
Yeah, but I mean, I like to see those resets, but it was way too slow. And now AQ has the prime position on this Drake, right? And we talked about Iowa's composition doesn't really have a way of just engaging, walking into the members. Now, Slicing Maelstrom is down as the Miasma comes out. He's just going to be walking through this bush. Looks like Tybro's getting a little, little bit low. The Rift Herald is actually summoned over here by Obi Top, and I think that one was just running up as the Rocket Jump comes over, just trying to find some members. And now we're just having this dragon dance going back and forth between Iowa, as actually they're trying to go in Obi Top and does find the Aatrox here. But so many members are so low, the Stormbringer comes down, but he's exhausted. He's in the middle of four members. Looks like Steven here picks up one kill, but the Cassiopeia has picked up two, and he's not done yet as the Senna picks up another. The dragon does go down to Iowa here, and AQ almost aced here. Double zero is the last one on the map. He's barreling down mid lane as he's determined the fight was pretty much over at the beginning. Yeah, a lot of gold going into University of Iowa here. PJR did dip out of the fight at the end there to try to get this Rift Herald charge off onto Tier 2 and to Inhibitor Turret. And we are now seeing this Cassio, the Senna, and this Ivern here. They are going to go for this Baron. They have... Plenty of time. Obi Toppin just now responding. Stevenator still with the 15 second respawn timer. And they are doing a good bit of damage onto this. We do see them moving through their jungle now. But I don't think they're going to be able to as there's only 2k left on this Baron. And that is going to be Baron going over to University of Iowa. University of Iowa just played that so expertly. I mean, AQ didn't have a word in those bush. So he just had, you know, Kodo just walking up, throwing down throwing down a miasma on two members, just burning them down to half health at the immediate beginning of the area to establish a position that AQ shouldn't have allowed them to. So really, really unfortunate for, from AQ, but well played from Iowa. They were able to expertly navigate some of those fightings, keeping AQ at range. And Fate's Call didn't really have the Slicing Maelstrom at the beginning of that fight, so he wasn't able to get in there. He had burned it previously. So Iowa pulling it back is now they've, you know, Added a little bit more time to the clock. They have that Baron. They stop that dragon stacking here. So it'll be another three minutes until that next Drake comes up. And if they're able to use this Baron effectively, they should again have some prime positioning for that objective. So now they're rushing all their members here into the mid lane, trying to burn down this mid lane turret against AQ. Yeah, University of Iowa has plenty of gold on the map still to catch up on. It is only one to four turrets. Those three easily make up the gap in difference there when it comes to this gold value. Yeah, AQ kind of misplayed there. They were allowing their Tristana and their set, you know, Tybro and PJR to get poked out by this Cassio. She does have the Leandri's Torment, which does do a lot of burn damage. And they're just going to have to be very careful with how they play these next few fights. They have the Baron. They're going to be getting as much gold as they can, pushing through top lane here. But we are seeing three members of AQ coming actually for this half health, you know, mid lane inhibitor turret here. Yep, they're just trying to set up the split push here. They're trying to base race as this one goes down. Obi top and flashes, bring down the Storm Call. Showstopper comes through. Shut down for Steven here against this Ivern. They aren't, ain't, they aren't able to break, quite break down this inhibitor here as Obi top is going to be slain by Kodo, which is a double kill so far. This Cassio really popping off in this game, but they're able to stop that push. They're wasting some time to the Baron, so not all bad for AQ. Breaking open an inhibitor turret is... A, a quite quite a feat to be honest this early in the game yeah and we did see stevenator actually it is a two for two trade overall the senna and the ivern did drop there and we are now kind of seeing the pressure bounce back and forth here baron is still up it's only pjr currently on to this mid lane but he has the gale force and did almost <laughs> execute that aatrox there that is going to be senna ultimate coming through and PGR is just going to clean up these minions, and they're going to keep this tier one mid lane turret alive. Yeah, it is. He does have the collector, so maybe get a little bit more damage to go down. But honestly, I think that might be a little bit of a mistake here for this Tristana. Uh, typically, we'll see, you know, um, oh, it was that item that that everyone was building, the storm something. Oh, I can't remember it. But anyway, it's 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 one of the the the, the one that you you attack someone and it slows them, right? We typically see that it's, it's one of those crit items for that Tristana, and then they build into Infinity Edge. So the Collector picked up does give a little bit more lethality, but not exactly what we would like. doesn't give you as much damage, so we'd like to see a, 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 maybe a different itemization change for double zero. But, I mean, he's not playing too bad. 1-1-2 one, one, on the Tristana has really been you know, focusing on these towers, had that little bit of lane dominance. But he needs to be very, very careful. As you can see, he doesn't really quite have the power to jump in and finish off some of these members, especially against that Aatrox, which is the beefiest boy on that team. Now it's the Steric's Gauge picked up, so he's going to be surviving even longer. So 
It's going to be very difficult to burn down some of these shields as the Nami's actually popped over here with that shockwave. Steven here going to killing spree. And Dingo Bingus goes down too. That's two members for Iowa just going down. So this should be an easy mid lane inhibitor push for AQ. Oh, that's so bad for Hawaiwa. Yeah, that is a very good catch coming out from AQ. They pulled the trigger real quick, able to pull out the Nami and the Ivern of the game. And now they're going to get that pressure. And that's 20 seconds. And then Ocean Drag spawns. That is sole point for them. We do see Aatrox here. Grundle Jelly, he has TP in top lane here. But that is still going to be Ocean Soul going over to AQ as Ivern is respawning as the Drake respawns itself. Yeah, so AQ in a prime position to take this one out, but Grendel is over that top lane, finally going to take over that top tier turret, but I don't think that's worth it. But, I mean, they can't contest that. Like like you said, like they, they just had the numbers. They weren't in position to do that, and this is huge for AQ. You, just, you talked about the combat power, you know, a few minutes prior, but now they have that mid lane inhibitor as well. That Baron will spawn in one minute, and we'll wait on the edge of our seats for some of that action, as I know Iowa is going to be wanting to make a stand here. Yeah, they'll have to be very careful uh, with Ivern and this Nami being taken out of fights like that. You know, those two are kind of like the, the, the battery packs of this group right now. They're able to keep the shields and the healing coming out. They're able to disrupt team fights and allow for this Castio and this Aatrox, you know, to, to fulfill their duties through these fights. But if they're taken out like that again, I think that might be close to end game here for Iowa. Yeah, and, and AC, I did find out the name of that island actually. It's Storm Razor, so I was close. On that one, that's typically what we see in the, the builds is, you know, Gale Force or Kraken Slayer with a Storm Razor into Infinity Edge. So a little bit of adaptation for from Double Zero. They pick up a kill now, 2 1 and 2. But that Collector, I think, is maybe an overused item. I think it's really good one ahead, right? You get that bonus goal, that lethality. But from an even or, or behind game state, it's actually uh, not as great as an item as you would think because that lethality only works when you're. Like I said, when you're in, when you're ahead, and it's not going to be cutting through some of these shields as effectively now. AQ having a little bit of reset. You have Fate Skull here in the top lane, and even gets he gets engaged on just by Grundle Jelly on that Aatrox. So if he's able to get out of those um, you know, those chains, those infernal chains, he should be able to go through. As Double Zero is going to be trying to jump in. That's kind of exactly what we didn't want to see. As that exhaust comes down, has to actually flash away. As Obi Top and now in the middle, the Storm Skull is going down. That Senna will be taken down by Double Zero. So a little bit more gold from that collector, not feeling too bad, but that's gonna give them the perfect chance to take this Baron. Yeah, <laughs> Iowa's now gonna be down a man as they're gonna have to watch AQ take this Baron in their face and they have the super minions in mid lane applying great pressure and AQ is very quickly taking this Baron down already past half health and we are gonna have to see Iowa back off from the map pressure they're gonna be presenting here and we're gonna most likely see AQ here rotate top lane try to take out these tier 2 turrets and start knocking on the outer edges of these inhibitors yep they have to go to the top lane that's the only wave the only, the only lane that has that wave pushing, yeah, I think Kodo's been doing a great job there in the bot lane, just pushing out these waves or holding them to get some more farm. And as you can see, that's been all, bounced all the way over to AQ's tier 2 turret. But now their eyes are set on the top wave. They do have a cannon minion. Another wave will be coming in a few minutes. But so much range from that Senna is, is able to, you know, just maybe chunk out this, this cannon a little bit. But they have to play pretty far back because you have to be aware of that, that Stormbringer from... This Fall Bear, he's able to immune the tower as Fate's Call has been caught up by those chains. They're trying to make a little bit of an engage, but not too much. Daisy is summoned there as kind of the, the guard here against AQ, but they're all just hanging around this turret. That's something that AQ doesn't quite have is, is a great siege, right? I mean, you do have the Orianna for that zone control, but the rest of your member needs to get pretty close in these fights. Yeah, Fate's Call here did rotate towards the mid lane here to buff up the two super minions that were there. And going back, their siege is a little rough. They're definitely looking to try to engage. That Stormbringer from Bully Bear does shut off turrets, but they're looking for a prime opportunity for this Command Dissonance to come out from Orianna, and they do eventually take this top lane Tier 1 inhibitor turret. It's just a war of attrition between these two squads. With the Ocean Soul, it allows AQ to stay in these fights. Fate's Call can split off, as he can always jump over with the Slicing Maelstrom. As the bubble actually gets onto the Tristan, the Chains land, the ultimate coming through from this Nami, and Obi Toppin can't get up if he's just locked down. The slicing Maelstrom coming through. Showstopper as well from the other side. The Maelstrom didn't find anyone, as Fate's Call is just going to be taking down a double kill for this Senna. As a double kill for the Orianna as well. Make that a triple. Aatrox taken down. This Orianna is huge. We'll see if he can stand up against this Cassio. They still have the Baron buff. This inhibitor is so low. If they're able to break open two of these inhibitors, they're going to set up this. The game is that huge chunk of damage coming out from Steven Nader. 
and Kodo's barely able to limp away. Yeah, Stevenator here is making the big plays, able to take two members out of the rift at the end of that fight when it looked so dark and grim for AQ. That is going to be both Nexus turrets going down, and we are now seeing Stevenator and PJR00 kind of on the back foot here. They're going to have to back away. Ivern is responding, Nami is responding, and that is the mid lane inhibitor respawning. But still, that is the two Nexus turrets gone. AQ looking in a prime position to start getting this bot lane out and three inhibiting Iowa here. Yep, yeah, they'll have to take down that mid lane inhibitor again for against Iowa, but I mean, they did open the top, so they still have some more of that pressure if they're able to rotate these waves, like you're talking about AC. But <laughs> you can see I am the Awesome 10. Almost went down to the minions there against the Nexus. So they have to be very, very careful as as these lanes will reset. But now this is going to be Elder Drake coming up in a minute. We're going to have another one of these fights here. And don't forget, this is a best of three series. And if this game is this close right now, I cannot wait for another Slaughter Fest here in game two. I'm excited to see that one. We'll see what the end result of this game oh, one sure. is. But we'll see. Uh, who's going to get here first? You have the Aatrox here in the top lane. He does have teleports who can join uh, the fights if he needs to. But there's not a lot of you know prime position wards for a flank. Although, I think Iowa does a pretty good job from a front to back standpoint, right? You can just throw down that Miasma. You have the Senna throwing through. And the Aatrox can stay on the back line. As the Miasma is actually going to be finding Time Bro here. He's trying to wrap around, pull off a pretty good flank. And... I think that's kind of the, the idea of a, of AQ, right? They want to pull off flanks. Iowa wants to fight front to back. So it's kind of the, uh, the different terms of, of, of ideology and how they want to fight this. As Iowa is going to have to funnel around some of these choke points. Aatrox is resetting. His huge shockwave just makes Steven in their god like instantly pops the Nami. And that could just be the pick they're looking for. They might not even have to fight. It's actually the Aatrox is going all in. But the showstopper pushes him out of the fight. The center ultimate is not going to tag anyone. Obi Toppin now is in the middle here. It's been Yasma. He can't jump around. Has that Stormbringer if he wants to turn around. Does finally go right onto the Cassio. But the shielding and healing is going to keep him popped off. His face call so low and ends up being taken down by Grundle Jelly. Now he's out of the fight as Steven Nader is able to pick up another one, 13-3-2 and two on this Orianna. But the rest of the members of Iowa are so low, and that's their tank down. Yeah, they're going to have to be very careful. Steven Nader, very strong in this game, does have the full five items completed. And a lot of these members here are within one shot distance of Steven Nader. Look at that. Going onto the Cassiopeia, she has the Cosmic Drive. That's command distance coming out, and Cassiopeia is going to have to back away from this. AQ, though, they're going to be very careful. They keep standing in that Miasma, coming out from this Cassiopeia. You know, that Leandre's Torment does so much damage right now. But there are super minions currently in the base of Iowa. They're trying to make the Desperation play, and we do see PGR coming over here with the Rocket Jump and the, the Explosive Charge. Double hop over, Explosive Charge once again onto this Ivern. And we are just seeing AQ run down these members. And that is going to be the TP coming out here from Fate's Call, and this Senna is going to be going down. Yeah, they didn't even finish off the Elder Drake there. They're just going right for the fight. They knew they had the damage. Divinator, 13-3 and 5. You could just see those chunks coming out. That Shockwave is a very, very short cooldown. So the Petrifying Gave just totally whiffs, just doesn't have the range in this. As now they're going to be making short work of this mid lane inhibitor. The Chem Take coming in as the Shockwave just doesn't go down onto Koto. As we have the Aatrox in the back line trying to take down Stevenator. He has the Sterics. He has the Gore Drinker popping, but he will go down as Fate's Call is able to pick one up. And AQ is setting their sights over over to the Elder Drake. They do have those minion waves pushing onto the Nexus, but they're not confident they can take that one down yet. And instead, they're going to be getting this combat buff as the Baron is coming up soon. If they're able to take down both of these huge objectives, that should open the gates against Iowa. Yeah, Iowa still has their 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 prime battery packs, as I was calling them earlier. The Nami and the Ivern still up, able to throw out the Daisy and the Tidal Wave. Keeping those tools for this Cassio is going to be their biggest way to win these next fights. And if AQ is able to get this Elder Dragon, it will be absolutely devastating for the side of Iowa. And that is going to be Ivern dropping right away. Now, AQ easily able to secure this Obi Top and the only member left on the Rift with Smite. And that is going to be the Elder Dragon taken. We are seeing the On My Way pings. They are coming for the final bite to the neck of Iowa here. Yep, they're not even going to be bothering with Baron. They just want to take this fight. He's had Tybro on the wings. My is being put down, but you can see he's a pretty tanky boy at this point. It only really has the dead man to be getting that force of nature here pretty soon. And that Elder 
Drake buff, they're going to be feeling very, very confident. And you can see Iowa, as soon as Dingle Bingus went down, they had to give that one up as the Cassio has to flash away, but Obi Top is going to flash right on top. Exhaust coming down, Stormbringer with it as they're going all in on this Cassio. That's the big member down. Stevenator gets the shutdown. That's an open Nexus as the Aatrox is the last one to stand in the face of Aquinas, but he's going to be pushed away. Shockwave coming down in that Nexus as well as AQ is going to take match one versus University of Iowa. Stevenator absolutely was running this game. AQ had to follow that ball as best as they could. They controlled the game through Stevenator, able to get these objectives. And Stevenator, when it came to these team fights, was usually the last man standing, but also the main driving force to why these team fights were staying even in kills. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was a lot of attention, I would say, coming out from, from Obi Toppin, right? He was running that map early, and scoreline 1, 4, and 11 at the end of it doesn't really show the early game dominance that, that Obi Toppin and Stevenator had, but he was really just making such huge advantages for Aquinas that even when I was able to hit some of their item breakpoints, even when they were able to get that Kraken Slayer, they had the Kodo coming online on this Cassiopeia. They just had such a huge advantage coming out from stacking those drakes that they had to force Iowa to come to them and fight on their terms. So great win from AQ. You can see they kind of had the macro games. Excited for match two for Iowa. Maybe just a few little bit of draft differences as I don't think, you know, having all, all four of those ranged matchups were the best. Uh, they're able to make it work, but in the end, AQ is able to take them down. So... Excited to see some, some some different looks here. Yeah, excited to see this game too. We are going to be right back. We're going to get the lobby set up and we're going to get right on to game two. We'll be back here in a few minutes.
Hello and welcome back to match two of Aquinas Esports versus University of Illinois. AQ is on the blue side this game and University of Illinois is on the red side. So a bit of a switch and my name is Blue Jay. And again with me, I have AC. How are you doing, my man? Doing good. We had a very good, fascinatingly long first game there. Very much so back and forth. The mid laners kind of dictated the pace and I'm really curious to see how game two is going to play out. Yeah, we saw Obi Toppin popping off in the early game there with a few different ganks, right? He got pretty much a, a, a kill over in the mid lane, then he moved over to the top side, got a kill onto the Aatrox as well, and you saw how huge Stevenator was from those early game leads. We talked about the turret plating going down, all the gold coming into the pockets of the carries of AQ, and it's actually pretty pre pleasantly surprised for Iowa's ability to come back out of that game, because it looked like they were in a pretty dire spot, but they were pulling out some of these team fights that I didn't expect them to win. Yeah, that Casio, I kept calling it and saying it. The battery pack that Casio had with that Ivern and Nami were able to keep any front line from AQ away, and she was able to use that Leandre's Torment, apply it to all members on the team there, and just burn them out, and they were just able to sustain those fights even through the Ocean Soul that AQ did have. Yeah, and... Before we talked about a few of the tools that, that AQ had to, to move around with uh, the Stormbringer on Volibear and the Rocket Jump for Tristana, but here's the deal, right? Cassiopeia's W is called Miasma, throws down that little purple bit of poison that you saw, and if you're stuck in that, you can't use movement abilities. So really, you either have to predict that and jump right before she throws it, or you're stuck there, which is why we saw Obi Toppin kind of burn, burning down so fast, like it's slowing you down, you can't... <laughs> You can't jump out of it. He wasn't able to use the Stormbringer, which is really some more tanky stats, right? You get that health, you jump into the back line. So that Cassio was a huge pickup, but already we're seeing a few adaptations coming up. The Udir, first pick for AQ, followed by Seraphine. I wasn't expecting to let that one go through. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, both Udir and Seraphine here were banned in game one, and we're now seeing both teams pick up respectively those champions. We're now seeing the Jarvan 4 coming out here for University of Iowa as their jungle to counter this Udir as best they can. Uh, I'm really looking to see. I think they're really going to want to play around Stevenator here. Try to get him something strong to go with that. Maybe an Orianna pick. Maybe something along the lines of the Azir. Stevenator has been always such a prominent player when allowed to play these control style mages. Yeah, looks like he's not going to be getting his pick up here quite yet. So we are having the Ezreal being locked in for Obi Toppin. Last year, I mean, or I mean, Obi Toppin locked that one in, but that's going to double zero, right? That's just the way draft phase works, excuse me. But yeah, double zero had a great showing on this Ezreal, who was the newer uh, Essence Reaver build into the Dusk Blade. So doing a lot of damage and you don't have to worry about mana since you're always, you know, topped off with that Essence Reaver passive as the last pick over here is going to be the Senna yet again. We'll see where the Seraphine goes. You could see another double ranged matchup for Iowa. You have a Seraphine support with the Senna or maybe you just do support Senna with, with the Seraphine just taking up all that farm as Aatrox was taken off the board for AQ in the first in the in the first round of bands so they don't want to see grundle jelly on that atrox again i actually thought that was very very effective when you have you know three shielding and healing champions just in your back pocket there so a little bit of adaptation on the other side for iowa as well as steven there's not gonna be getting his oriana this time around yeah seraphine and senna have been a very prominent bot laners uh this last two patches or so and when you pair them together, you're able to have that versatility of having which one farm and which one be the support. But either way, they are going to be able to do a lot of damage, apply a lot of crowd control, and keep their teammates sustained up. Uh, if this Jarvan does get to go tanky, he is going to be very hard to kill. He, they're going to have to deal with the shield and the cataclysm and keep that distance between them, you know. Leona may be able to get through that front line, but Udyr does only have the ability to walk here. Sarah and... Yeah, Seraphine and Senna are going to be pretty well protected already with how they're set up. And to be honest, I would actually like to see Cassio being picked up again for Kodo, put that Seraphine in the bot lane. Actually, doesn't too do too bad into Leona Ezreal, right? I mean, you can keep your range with the Senna Seraphine, so you're not really going to be in any danger. Instead, it's going to be the Rakan picked up. They want to go all in in some of these team fights. Yeah, by the looks of it, that might, that might just be the Seraphine mid lane here. 
She has been showing a rise here in the ADC and the mid lane role. And with that Rakan Senna, they're going to have a very good engage and consistent CC. And I'm very curious to see what they're going to hear, have here for their top lane. And we are going to see the NAR coming out here, most likely for Fate's Call. And, I, you know, we haven't really discussed about AQ's team comp here. What, what would you say some of their objectives are here right now? It's kind of it's kind of odd. I mean, they have a little bit of a mix of, of things they want to do, but I think with that Nar and, and the LeBlanc pickup, I think they're really looking to split up the map, right? Nar can be an effective team fighter, but he actually has a really strong, you know, split pushing potential when he's in mini Nar, and 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 this LeBlanc can be popping out in the side lanes as well, getting some of these you know good team fights, and I think that's what they wanted to draft against Iowa, who is. 100% a team fighting composition, right? You don't stick this in, in the side lane. You don't stick the Seraphine in the side lane. J4 wants to get in the middle of a team fight, hit that Cataclysm. You have the Encore coming out from Seraphine. You know, the Senna uses her ultimate across the fight, even, you know, the, the grand entrance from, from Rakan coming through and the Gangplank ultimate. So I think NQ is just trying to counter what, what Iowa is doing. And I kind of like what they're doing. I think it's just, a, it's going to be a little more difficult with, with an Udir and Leona. I don't think... You know, can do anything but engage, really. I, they can kite back, but just very, very immobile as the support champion. So we'll see what Tybro can do on this Leona. But I think for the rest of the team, they really just want to split up the map. Yeah, they're going to have to be very careful. If they ever get into these awkward 5v5 situations, I think University of Iowa is going to be looking, at, you know, aiming the gun. AQ is going to be staring down the barrel, and they're going to have to be very, very careful. One CC chain will end an entire team fight for them. We do have the three minute delay still here. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit more about how Iowa's going to be positioning here. They have a late game comp for sure. They are looking to scale up. Most likely we'll be giving up that first, maybe second dragon and getting uh, together after that. Dragon control, I think is going to be very important, especially if we see again that ocean soul or even the mountain soul coming out in this game. Yeah, I think the the point of focus that they could do is into the bot lane. Like I talked about this Leona, right? It's very, very immobile, right? You, the only thing you can really do effectively is engage and stun up the other team. So if if Nachiji on this Recon can get Leona, just bait them into a fight when Dingle Bingus is around on this J4, you can pretty much pop that Leona. But the mid lanes can be pretty dangerous for Goto on this Seraphine. It's, it's one of those champions that are very similar to Sona, which have very, very low like resistance stats, especially as she scales. She's one of the squishier champions in the game. And guess what? This LeBlanc loves to pop those squishy champions. So if Steven here can get ahead in this matchup, it's pretty much GG in that landing phase against this Seraphine. So really looking at the bot lane for Iowa to really take over this fight and have that Seraphine gangplank later on with that scaling. Um, with the newer build for Senna, of course, she she's very, very strong in, in the late game. But don't underestimate her early game dueling power, especially with that last embrace to lock people up with this Rakan. So I, I like what both these teams are doing, and it, it really comes down to which one can do their, their game plan better. But I would like to see Steven Dater pop off again, because there's a lot of targets he can run through. Yeah, for sure. Steven Dater, if he's able to pop the Seraphine or even the Senna, Iowa's damage profile drops drastically, especially considering that Gangplank takes a while to scale up. Two, three items is what he's going to need to actually have an impact on these fights. Besides that, he's going to be able to drop the ultimate down, but he's just going to be trying to stay in that side lane and scale up as best as he can. And you kept yeah. talking about the side lane here. I think Fates Call and Steven are going to be playing you know, side lane and jungle as much as they can. Uh, I would definitely like to see the... Early aggression from AQ has to be on the spot lane, I think. Yeah, for sure. Uh, if we're going back to that sideline point, if, if you don't mind, it's just that Gangplank is probably one of the harder champions to play. So we'll see if Grundle Jelly has been doing his homework, has been skirmishing and, and, and scrimming on this Gangplank for a few games because he takes a lot of time to master. So if, if he's just an average Gangplank, I don't think you can really go toe-to-toe -to -toe versus a Gnar, but if you're able to hit some of these barrel chains and, and knows how to push these waves early, then you can be very, very effective. And we will be taking a short break here as we're going to be loading onto the Rift. So we will see you soon for match two of AQ Esports versus the University of Iowa.
All right, we are back on the rift right now. <clears throat> we are having a little bit of technical difficulties at the moment. Blue Jay will have to be joining us here back in a second, but we are going to be getting on in the rift here. We are seeing the five point come out from both teams. Obi Toppin is following Stevenator here, kind of scoping out to see if that Jarvin's going to be starting this red buff. And we are seeing First Strike is actually going to be the Mountain Dragon. And I do think we have Blue Jay back. <laughs> yeah, sorry if I it wasn't quite caught up at the moment. So I uh, just took a little bit of technical issues. So can we jump in just a second? I'll watch your stream for a little bit. But like you say, it's going to be that 5.4 now. We'll see what, what these teams choose to do here. Yeah, we are seeing both teams. They are starting the red buff right now. <clears throat> we did talk about, and we kept talking about, how these teams are going to be kind of focusing on these bot lanes. If they can get either side ahead, it's going to be very, very good for both teams. If the Ezreal's allowed to get ahead and play on the side of these fights, it's going to be very hard to catch them. You know, the only person that really will be able to lock down this Ezreal, at least for the start of it, will be this Jarvan. And we are seeing early trades RPC. coming out. Yeah, yeah, exactly like you say. AC is going to see those early chains coming out from that mid lane. You have that Corrupting Potion for Stevenator here. Take that Electrocute and Ignite. So you can see he wants to win this landing phase. He just doesn't want to sit by, wait for later in the game. He wants to go all in early. And it, it doesn't look like we're going to be seeing too much cheese here for, for you know, Dingle Bingus here. Sometimes we'll see like a level 2 gank um, after that fret buff. But he doesn't really have that priority or the lockdown in the mid lane or in the top side. So pretty standard clear. Chains land against Toto here, and some nice damage for Stevenator. Yeah, <clears throat> we're going to have to see how well Stevenator can balance it. He does have the Ignite as opposed to Seraphine's Teleport in the slain matchup. PGR did get poked out a little bit, and we are seeing the Zenith Blade come out from the Leona tie, bro. It does get the stun onto Senna, and they are keeping up the aggression here. And that is going to be the heal and the exhaust, as well as Senna's flash coming out from Iowa, and only the Ignite from AQ. Well, that was so good from AQ's bot lane. They ticked over to level 2, and immediately Tybro lands that Zenith Blade, goes all in, double zero gets that Arcane Shift, and able to trade summoners so effectively. So, well done from AQ's bot lane, and now we'll wait to see where, if, uh, you know, Obi Toppin wants to play a visit there soon before those flashes are up for I am the awesome 10 here on this center, because that's definitely a lane you can abuse, but Dinkle Bing is also on his way to the bot lane. They have that word out, so they should spot him, but Typro's really, really far up in that bush. Yeah, they're like we said, they're going to have to be so very careful. They do have the wards out. They do spot Dingle Bingus, <clears throat> and they're going to try to see if they can push this wave under turret real quick, shove it in, and try to get the reset. They're going to be in a very dangerous spot here as PJR does get snared up. <clears throat> you talked about it earlier, how Gangplank's a little bit hard of a champion, especially when you're, you know, opposed to this Gnar. If he's able to get the barrel combos off, we are seeing some aggression here. That is a swag flag coming through, and that is going to be a missed opportunity. We are seeing aggression here at the top lane. This is going to be first blood going over to Gangplank, and we are seeing that bot lane did escape. That was Tybro. He did have to use his flash there, <laughs> but you talked about it earlier. We were hoping that Grundle Jelly did his homework in that Gangplank Nar matchup, and it appears that he did as he did pick up that first blood. Yeah. You know, this Gangplank is actually a really deadly force early if you can get some of those passive flames going on. As you can see, he has that Corrupting Potion, and he's just going to keep hitting those Qs against you with that, that Grasp of the Undialing with those par with those Parleys, just stacking up that damage to so get really, really low. And you can see him taking down Fate's Call for First Blood. Feels really, really good on this Gangplank mashup. He's already has that 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 bonus gold increase of the Zenith Blade Rands against single Bing I mean, Dingo Bingus, and he doesn't have the flag and drag. He used his flag earlier as Grundle Jelly on the top side is going to be traded back as Double Zero picks up one for himself against Dingo Bingus, and Fate's Call will pick up another, so trading back some of that pressure. Pretty smoothly for AQ. Yeah, very, very well executed early play here. They may have lost the first blood, but they do pick up the two kills there, now up by about 700 gold. And that is a kill going on to Fate's Call, as well as a kill going on to PJR. And that is exactly what AQ wants to see right now. Get the star ahead to match up against this Gangplank once again. And if they can get PJR up ahead here against this Senna Rakan lane matchup, they're going to be very hard to deal with. And this Ezreal is going to become a very powerful force 
in these poke fights. He's able to build that Essence Reaver and the Dust Blade right now. Very good builds coming through, rather than the you know the usual Triforce Man immune style. Yep, and you can see Grundle Jelly's wave was just in such a bad spot. He really needed to push that one in, which is why he was in just too far forward and allowed Obi Toppin to get that gank off. Well, he almost traded back onto Obi Toppin on that Udyr. You can see he had to burn his flashes now. Both junglers paying dividends to the mid lane, trying to push these in. Tybro here as well, just trying to get a reset for their mid laners here. And Grundle Jelly. Grundle Jilly had to teleport back in as that wave was was kind of frozen and it's not too bad. I mean, typically you might see trades of TP, but it is gangplank, so you can always throw down his ultimate across the map. He's not limited by range on that, so he'll be able to impact the map from from his lane. So even blowing teleport early doesn't feel as bad. Yeah, and especially since he does have that Sheen Longsword and Corrupting Potions, he's able to poke out the Snar while able to just apply mass pressure to this top lane. You know. If that Gnar does in fact get to ultimate stage here with the Mega Gnar, he's able just to eat the oranges and get out of the fight as quick as possible. And you see that he's backing up just a little bit right now. And we are seeing Dingle Bingus. He is kind of hovering around this Earth Dragon right now. And we're seeing early aggression here from PGR. That was a good land of the Mystic shot. Yeah, speaking of having that Sheen, you have double zero with that. It also has two long swords, so... He did have his Mystic Shot buffed in the last patch, right? He has a, a bonus AD damage, e e even more, about you know 30% AD more. <laughs> so that's why you've been seeing more of this Essence Reaver into Dustblade build. You're going to get full extent of that, as Iowa's going to be taking down that Mountain Drake. So we're not going to be seeing a Mountain Soul, no more shielding uh, for, for that when, when the time comes. But already, that's a pretty good pickup for, for Iowa. You, you like to say that here early they might have to give up that first trick but they're able to pick that one up so they're kind of ahead of a clock already yeah very well done from iowa here we do see obi top and he is getting some of that early counter jungle pressure you know iowa took the first dragon but obi top in here is clearing the top side of dingle bingus's jungle here it is you know 55 to 43 that's about two three camps we're seeing the aggression coming in from nar and he gets killed before mega nar even comes out Obi Toppin not able to chase through the Gangplank Cannon Fire. And that is just going to be an unfortunate misplay coming out for AQ. Yeah, Fate's Call just wasn't able to transform in time. Excellent play from Grundle Jelly. It's something you, you can actually do on Nar. I don't think his rage was stacked up quite enough where his, his jump was going to be triggering it. But you can actually use the jump and ult while you're in the air. That'll transform you right away. And, and maybe if he waited like a quarter second longer, he could have got that one off. And then... Yeah, it'll be top of the top side to finish that one off, but wasn't able to do it as you have the Zenith Blade ran from the Recon. The Zenith's so far away, he can't get out of there. The Ignite goes down, he's burning, he's getting very, very low, but Obi top in here in the middle lane. Dingle Bears actually does get the kill with the Lance there. Stevenator goes down. Obi Toppin rooted up here. They're trying to trade it back on us. We have multiple fights across the map. Obi Toppin's trying to run it through. Takes a tower shot, but those minions are hitting him hard. He's able to run away. Fate's call on the top side, trading back with Grundle Jelly. So skirmish is all across the map. Yeah, for AQ, that was just a series of unfortunate events. <clears throat> across the lane matchups there. They were just not able to find any of the pickup kills that they were looking for there. Seraphine just barely escaping as she was ignited. And that is going to be Fate's Call getting flashed on. And that is going to be the Gangplank passive damage as long with that Q Sheen collecting the Gnar body. Well, that's just disgusting. GP damage. Let's... That's why when GP gets ahead early, your, your lane's pretty much over because there's not really a fair trading p pattern against you know, gangplank that can just use that parlay on target. You don't even have to aim the thing. You just click on the enemy champion and you can see he has that flash up, flash is getting with the passive like you're talking about. Picks up another solo kill onto Fate's call and now 3-1-0 and zero has the Essence Reaver completed on this gangplank before 10 minutes. However, Double Zero does have that one as well, but that's a solo laner against... You know, this Gnar, it's just not going to feel good for Fate's Call at this point. Yeah, it really only has the Chain Whip there itself. Still trying to get that, that Stride Ring. And that's going to be the Flash coming out from Obi Toppin, though. Trying to take out the Seraphine. He's going to be dropping as well. And AQ cannot hit the mark right now with their composition. Just feels like AQ's getting so desperate trying to make those plays. You just take the trade of the Chains on that LeBlanc. You're not going to finish that one off, especially with that Senna hitting level 6. So maybe if... if that ultimate didn't come quite through for, for center. They had a little bit more damage. That one turns around, but 
Maybe you're saying some of those jungle nerfs coming in, right? Maybe uh, Udyr would have a little bit more levels, have a little more HP and damage on that one, as looks like Dingo is going to be paying a second one. The Flag and Drag does miss over here, and Steven here just using that uh, jump away, accidentally holding that one until the, the swag flag you were talking about. Did go down, so he's not going to be knocked up. So great play from Stevenator, but AQ falling further and further behind in this match. Yeah, still only down about 700 gold right now. <clears throat> you know, we're not really seeing any any turret place getting picked up. PGR is a monster, though, right now in this lane, as Tybro has been roaming the top side, and they're going to be trying to go Ooh. on Dinglebangs here. He does get the swag, flag, and drag off before the Zenith Blade Sun can even come out. And they're just narrowly missing these opportunities here. Yeah, with some interactions, if you land that Zenith Blade before movement ability, um, that actually follows you, but that one didn't happen. But a quick pan to the top side just saw one Q from Grundle Jelly, just half health fates call in this matchup. So, oh my, it's just looking pretty, pretty done so for, for fates call over here. If he can just survive long enough, though, get some tankier stats, manage these plays. It's not over. Like you said, double zero is huge on this Ezreal. He can be the way back into this game. He has more range than most of the members for that. And you can already see he's going 2v1. Already has both of them to half health and not going to be running out of mana anytime soon. So this Ezreal is pretty much fully online here. Yeah, he's being very well executed on this Ezreal. He's able to use the Mystic Shot and the Arcane Shift to keep himself at a safe distance from this, you know, from the Senna, from this Rakan. He still has both summoners up and he is just playing a very dangerous game as we do see the Senna coming down here sorry the Seraphine we are seeing the the double stun come out but it's not going to land we do see Obi top in here as that is the Zenith Blade coming out and that is going to be a miss from the Leona ultimate flashing through here that is going to be the teleport now coming out from Grundle Jelly and AQ is just not able to finish off any of these marks and we are seeing Dingle Bing has come through here swag flag drag and that is going to be a very dangerous situation there. Steveniter does try going in, but that's not going to be much. And that's going to be a double kill now going on to Grundle Jelly. And this Gangplank is now just so huge. 5-1-0 and zero on this Gangplank. 400 gold bounty already at 12 minutes. And that team fight wasn't looking too good for either side, to be honest. A lot of key abilities missed. You had, you know, that the dropped the beat for, for Seraphine. Not landing onto anybody. Tybro tries to turn around, but then his Solar Flare goes wide and a few Mystic Shots didn't have enough damage to take down the rest of Iowa and somehow they're able to come out on top. That's, like you said, another double kill for Grundle Jelly on this Gangplank. And, ooh, it's it's going to be hard for AQ at this point. Now down two Drakes. Only down a thousand gold, which is honestly not too bad, but you have to just look at the lane advantages for Iowa at this point. Yeah, and I said it earlier right now, <clears throat> Iowa is looking to scale up in this game, and they are already, you know, that five kill lead, the Zenith Blade coming out from Tybro, but they just do not do any damage right now, and Seraphine only adding a blow flash and does get out of there. Yeah, Iowa's in a very good spot right now, if they can keep this kind of consistent lead right now, they're going to be scaling very well into this late game. Gangplank will only become scarier as he gets second item, third item. And if he stays ahead like this, I feel very bad for Fate's Call for trying to stay in this lane matchup. For sure. And, you know, I'd say AQ kind of had the right idea there, right? Play wrong your strong member, which is double zero on this Israel. They try to, to kind of turn that gank around, but... They had the, the match coming up from the Gangplank, just that ultimate coming through. So now they've set up a little bush trap here that Rakan just being poked out. The Zenith Blade does land, but he should use the Battle Dance away. He does get another charge of that as the last embrace lands onto Tybro. And you can see how difficult it is for them to lock down any of these members, especially that Rakan. That's not the target you really want to be going onto. But I, again, it just came down to, to that team fight of, of, of execution. And just I was able to match them perfectly using those members very very effectively and now we're seeing that LeBlanc here in the mid lane falling further and further behind that verdant barrier being completed for Seraphine which is really really good in that matchup specifically and since that Udyr actually does more magic damage than he does physical so even if she, he's ganked or Tybro lands his abilities they're all ability damage so you can see they just don't do damage to the Seraphine at this point and that's that's really bad for AQ. You want your LeBlanc online and you want them popping, and that's just not happening right now. Yeah, they're going to be very careful here. <clears throat> PGR is kind of the only one that's having a lead on their counterpart. 
and we are seeing that the Dingle Bingus Jarwin is currently onto this Rift Herald. Stevenator is trying his best to get these pokes off, but that was a full combo rotation coming out, including the ultimate was not much, but we are seeing Fate's Call is jumping in on this Gangplank, trying to get aggressive, as we are seeing a play now hit the bot lane here. We are seeing the Solar Flare miss. It goes a little bit wide, so does the Senna ultimate, so they are going to be picking up the Senna so far. Fate's Call, great trade onto Grundle there in the top lane, but now the Encore also goes wide for that Seraphine, so they're not getting anything done. Their eyes are still set on the bot lane. Zenith Blade goes around, but the grand entrance comes through, and Double Zero is able to pick up the kill, but looks like J4 broke open that mid lane in turret. That's first turret of the game, so large influx of gold, but that's not the member you want to go on as Tybro's going to be summing up Dingle because and look at that damage from Steve Nader, though. The Zenith Blade follows him through. They're able to finish that one off. The Cataclysm going down, and the Seraphine's going to be picking up that kill. Yeah, Dinglebing's just able to escape from this fight like that. Did get the flash off. Steven are trying to follow here. Does connect the chain, but it has to stay away. That Seraphine is very much so interposing and very frightening at this stage of the game. But Fate's Call is going to be getting that first turret compared to this Gangplank. Yeah, so you can, solve, you can see that Fate's Call, if he's not being completely poked out there, has a pretty good trading p pattern. You had that, that Stride Breaker complete. It was able to slow him down. That full combo... Almost took down Grundle Jelly, but he played that very, very well. He After he got stunned up, he ran back into his ultimate, which slowed down Fate's Call. was able to just dance away from some of that damage. So he has done his homework, but now he's actually falling behind on CS off of that bot lane play. But, I mean, that's Gangplank, man. He literally just has gold in his pockets. Every time he takes down a minion or gets a kill with his parlay, his Q, he gains bonus gold. And that actually stacks on his barrel. So if he lands more barrels uh, and, and takes them down... Uh, which is procced by your parlay, by the way, you get even more gold. So feels really, really good to be on this side of the matchup this early on. Actually has the Ionian boots as well. It's it's kind of the newer trend. We're seeing a lot more champions pick that up as, you know, that, that 20 ability haste here early is actually more or less converting to 18% cooldown reduction, which is pretty insane at, at for such a low cost on an item. Yeah, for sure. And we do see the Noon Quiver as well as the Vamp Scepter coming out for Gangplank. He's most likely going to be building that Immortal Shield Bow. You know, he'll be getting that giant lifeline shield that he's able to as well, the lifesteal. And he's just able to just apply pressure with his barrels like that onto Fate's Call. And we are seeing now Iowa is setting up vision around Dragon number three. We haven't really talked about it, but it is Infernal Dragon. And going on to a team like this, Infernal Drake's soul is going to be horrific. Especially with that Gangplank. He has so many ways of activating that in a team fight, but AQ is going to be responding here. Dragon has a third of their health taken off. TP coming from Grundle Jelly. Looks like the J4 is going in, but he's stunned up. Cataclysm goes down into double zero. He's taken very, very low, and Grundle Jelly is able to pick up that kill. Obi Toppy trying to run away. The Encore is landing onto multiple members, but Stevenator being stunned up, locked down, is able to trade across onto the center, but he gets taken out. But a huge Gnar finds two members, but. That's just not going to be enough as Grundle Jelly is going to be picking up another kill. Fate's Call, the last one alive, but a double kill for this Gangplank. And make that an Infernal Dragon as Iowa easily comes up on top. Yeah, so much shielding and healing coming out from the Seraphine and the Rakan. You know, the Grand Entrance able to bring it through. It almost looked like AQ could clinch that last end of the fight. But unfortunately, Seraphine was able to survive so damn long through the fight and that's just going to be drake three as well as so many kills going on to iowa and this was the big problem we we saw for aq right like they they built a composition to try and resist the plan of of iowa but if they're not ahead in this matchup like this leblanc they can't burst down anyone they can't get the seraphine they can't get the j4 and even if they get i am awesome he is not <laughs> he is not the member that you really want to be bursting down right this gangplank is so ahead in this matchup you can see all that damage coming down from his ultimate from the barrels just burning people out his double zero is just in the middle of the enemy team's jungle and three members here are trying to respond tybro four levels down from that mid laner obi top and slowed they are going to get that red buff for for iowa onto that setup so i mean that's a pretty big win but aq just fighting off way more than they can chew yeah, AQ donated a flash over to Iowa there from PJR. <clears throat> They're kind of looking a little disjointed right now. They're going to have to be very, very careful as this is an 8-in-1 gangplank with two items completed and a BF sword in his pocket. It kind of reminds me of a, 
one of the professional games that that I watched. He got like a a double kill at level one, came back with a sheen, and from there on out, he he ran the lane. You could saw. I mean, he wasn't as fortunate in this game, but got the first blood and able to come out with his first back with that sheen. Is in slowly able to run this lane and now slowly able to run this game over on this gank plank. So very very effective for Grundle Jelly. I would I would say that's a that's a pretty good trade. I I'd rather have him on this gank plank than that Aatrox, to be honest. As Wow, he actually forces out the Gangplank ultimate onto that top side. Yeah, that a pretty good trade there. Steve Nader just going in for poke and does get the Gangplank ultimate out. And that's going to be a big tool down for a little while here. AQ hopefully can make advantage of that. We will see here. Unfortunately, there's not really any objectives to take for, for AQ. Right? It's, it's Baron buff. Or Baron is up, but there's not really anyone you can go through. There's the Chemtake Flash coming out from Obi Toppin on the top side here. And that's going to be a kill over to Obi Toppin. So they are making use of that. They are getting a few picks. That might be their way back into this game. Like I said at the, at the beginning, we talked about the AQ wanted to split up the map. And you have that Seraphine out on that side lane. You can see now that Steven here has that Luden's Echo and that Flash coming out from Obi Toppin. She just got burst like a bubble. Yeah, but you have to take in consideration they got the kill, but they did trade and ignite and Obi Toppin's flash for that. He's not going to be able to get out of the Cataclysm anymore. He's going to have a very hard time here positioning, especially with this dragon spawning in two minutes. Yeah, two minutes on dragon, five minutes on a flash. So Obi Toppin's not even going to be able to steal that one away if he's forced into that. He has to go around the wall. So AQ literally has to win a team fight or get there first or something before anything comes out. But that Cataclysm isn't going to be over here as well. Double Zero doesn't have that Arcane Shift quite yet. Trying to get those reasons for the Mystic Shot actually steps right back in. Maybe trying to trade that kill back onto the Senna. But Senna is the one who's going to be taking that one up. Yeah, kind of a misplay. PGR is by himself, and he had no vision on the top side. Did have two members in Bot River there, but they are being pinged out. And that's just going to be a loss opportunity. He was playing very aggressive with that Arcane Shift, but does not net any value for AQ here. And this... You got to remember, this is this is Infernal Soul, right? And we've already talked about the devastating ability from, from some of these damaging members, but they can do that from such a long ways away. Even... The Demacian stand from the J4 can proc that Infernal Drake. You know, uh, a Senna Q, the Piercing Darkness, from <laughs> half your screen away can proc that. Anything really could just start chunking you out of this fight, especially against, you know, someone like Steven Eater, who's very, very squishy on this LeBlanc, right? That's kind of the trade-off when you have some of these assassins. Is that Yes, you do damage, but you also take a lot of damage. You're not building those resistances. And it's going to be very, very difficult for, for AQ to find their footing here on this Drake. However, they do have... Um, some, some of the advantage of clearing out this, this vision first. They're trying to reset. Fate's Call will have his TP by the time this one comes up. But the rest of the members here are coming in through against this Drake for Iowa. So they need to be very, very careful here. Maybe AQ goes for a little bit of pick early. You do have two items completed for this Ezreal. So get enough of this poke off, you can win some of these fights. Yeah, we do see Fate Skull. He is topside. He's going to be working on these minions. He does have the teleport ready. See when you're trying to get the poke out. We have 20 seconds left on this Infernal Dragon. Uh, yeah, Fate Skull just needs to get that Meganar form up and ready for if a team fight does start. He's going to need to be there. There's just going to be a very hard time taking out this Jarvan, this Rakan, and Seraphine especially. <clears throat> we are seeing the, the TP come out from both sides. Grundle Jelly and Fate's Call here. But we're not really going to be able to see Fates Call jump in. Meganar already halfway through. Kind of a missed opportunity there from AQ. And that's going to be a big ultimate taken out now. This Gangplank does come through. So the Flare does miss. And that's going to be the grand entrance. Does hit now four members. The Encore does come out from Seraphine. Charming up two members. And that is going to be Gangplank with a double kill. With something Glock for the triple kill. And we're going to see Jarvan here chasing over PJR. Does get the swag. Flag drag and drops him. Stevenator running for his life, and he is going to get taken out. Oh, no, he didn't. He was able to flash over the ultimate, and he's just running for dear life, and that is going to be Infernal Soul now going on to Iowa, and that's Flash. This is just a game of cat and mouse now for Stevenator. <laughs> he's trying to run around with those distortions. It's, maybe he's, he's, he's gone now. He hasn't taken damage in a long time. Might get the Executor. Maybe he'll actually get the back as... Looks like Kodos decided that the minion wave is more important with their eyes set on Baron, but you see all that damage coming out in the first few seconds of the fight, and that Senna still had that ultimate in her back pocket to try and finish off Steven here. They didn't even need it for that team fight. This Gangplank 11, 1, and 2 picked up that triple kill in that fight fully online, and 
Iowa in a prime position to take this match too. Yeah, definitely. Soul plus Baron, and they are powerhouses. This Gangplank is going to be able to go in any lane, and he will easily Glock any member that shows up to oppose him. They have to be so very careful, AQ, here. Gangplank is 11, 1, and 2, and he has the completed Infinity Edge, and we are seeing the Serrated Dirk come out. Most likely going to be built into the Collector, and there's a Cataclysm coming out from Dinglebingus. And this is a very scary game for the side of AQ. See, Double Zero just tagged up here, slowed by so many different abilities. Now, Tybro's being caught in the last Embrace. Battle Dance comes through, and it looks like the Rakan's actually picking up that kill. Steven here now in the middle of four members trying to trade back. The Game Boy pops the little blast cone, but Dingle Bingus is going to be popping Stevenator in this fight. They're just running across the map. They have the Baron buff. They might just look to end here. Looks like Double Zero is on the wrong side of the fight as Obi Toppin goes down. All members are up for Iowa. They have a huge wave, a double cannon minion wave. They could just look to open the base and end the game here. Yeah, Iowa is running through with a storm. They have 20 seconds to Stevenator, 26 seconds on Obi Toppin, and they're able to be so aggressive. And PGR is just now getting the recall off. Fate's Call and Tybro alone defending. That is going to be Nexus Turret 1 falling. Tybro just getting abused by these candy minions. That is going to be the Rakan going in. He does secure the kill. Fate Skull does get the Gnar off of it. That's going to be PGR. He does pick up the kill onto Seraphine. And that is going to be the Gangplank Flash Cube Parlay. And does gather the gold that is Ezreal. Yep. So, my street, a little bit of the bug they have right now with some of the replays where the game will end uh, right before the Nexus goes down. But Iowa does secure that win. So, great job for Iowa in match two. Uh, we will be moving over to match three, and this is where it matters. AQ can't afford to lose a game or else they're going to be knocked out of playoffs. So, first two games didn't matter. It all comes down to the third one here. Yep, and we'll be right back in just a few minutes with game three.
Hello and welcome back to the third and final match of Aquinas Esports versus University of Iowa. AC, it all comes down to this match here. Yep, we are currently at a best of three, and it is one to one. This game will decide the fate for AQ. If they're able to take it, they go 4 1, and they still have chance for playoffs. If not, this could end their dreams today. Yeah, it. it could be detrimental here for AQ, but we won't stop streaming. We still want to get, you know, our, our, our games in. But exciting to see this one here. I think Iowa made the changes that we asked of them um, in, from the first game. But uh, AQ needs to bounce back because this is the team we're supporting. This is the one we want to see win. Yeah, for sure. AQ has been doing phenomenal these past few matches, and we really want to see them bring it all back together, just like they were able to at the end of that game one there. And I, I really hope that they try to play a style like that once again. The Udyr not exactly doing it for me. When he has something Obi Toppin, like the Volley Bear or some kind of engaged champion, he's really able to enable his team. Yeah, and I think Udyr's kind of brought to another level when you're able to pair it off with something like a Senna. Right, because you get that that damage coming through in a line, you're able to heal, and then you have your ultimate over top to do damage and shield the rest of your team while he gets in there. But with some of these other champions that don't quite have a, a, as much supportive carrying abilities, it doesn't seem like it's, it's bringing to its full potential here. So kind of glad to see that one taken away. And now Seraphine's going to be the first champion picked up for AQ and answered by a Lux. Ooh, very interesting pick here. Can be flexed to both mid and bot lane, but we are seeing the Dingle Bingus Jarvan out here once again. I'm really curious to see what AQ might have to answer for this Jarvan. He was able to apply a good bit of pressure here in the early stages of the game. Yeah, neat to see uh, J4 being brought up again. Uh, it seems like he really never goes down in, in any of these metas. Just so effective with his kit, that Cataclysm. Coming out, able to lock down champions. He has such good gank assist with his flag and drag combo. And remember that you can't really cleanse or get rid of a knockup ability. The only way you can do that is if you have a cleanse and movement ability. So you literally have to have, like, cleanse and flash or, or QSS and flash. So, And it's much better usually just flash away from that initial knockup. So it's, it's so difficult to get away from this J4. It has so much base damage and can clear so effectively. It's so much huge team fight potential. And it makes a lot of sense with the new you know, the new jungle changes where you're not getting quite as much XP, you're not getting as much gold. So if you're spending your time ganking and following up plays, then you're not losing as much from the other side when the enemy team invades and takes away those camps. And guess who's going to be taking away those camps? It's going to be the Olaf for Obi Toppin. Yeah, we are seeing potentially both bot lanes have been locked in with this Misfortune Lux and the Jin Seraphine. I'm very curious to see how these next few bands are going to go. Iowa is banning away the Leona. <clears throat> they are predicting that that Seraphine is going to be mid lane here. And that's going to be the Gangplank Respect ban coming out from AQ against Grundle Jelly. Glad to see that one off the table because Grundle Jelly was insane on that, that GP in game two. Like he was pretty much dictating the entire pace of the game. Cho'Gath will follow for the bans and Leona and Shen taken off the table. So Oh, we're uh, seeing the set some come out here. Yeah, so see, set is going to be banned. We did see Tybro. Taking off the table. Yeah, we did see Tybro. He played it in game one, and now they're taking away the set. Leona has been banned. Shen has been banned. Alistar has been banned. They're trying to limit the numbers of Tommy, Tybro, Gale, the second pool here, but I'm really hoping to see if we're seeing the Malphite come out here, most likely going to Fate's Call. Very curious. I'm kind of enjoying AQ's team comp right now. They have good engage potential as well as good safe distance. So something I brought up with that Udyr is that that Senna pick, right? We were able to overtop some of that damage. But, I mean, Olaf kind of follows the same board, but now you have the Malfoy, Malphite as well. So, <laughs> you know, that Karma is actually going to fill up that position too with those Mantra shields <laughs> healing up and providing some of that damage across your whole team. The Malphite goes in with those huge ultimates along with that Seraphine's Encore. So, really, really great composition coming out of AQ. And I like this Silas pickup for Kodo. That's something we might see as a pretty good counter into Seraphine where you can take away that Encore and use it very, very effectively. But maybe it's going into the top lane. I can see that, see that as well. I honestly thought it could be a few different things you could have seen 
you know, the, the set in the top lane, you could have seen the, the Lux support, all sorts of things moving around. But in the end, it's going to be pretty standard for, for, Iowa, for Iowa, except maybe that Silas in the top side. I'll be honest, I was I was kind of going on a women of prayer for a hot minute there. I, we saw the Malphite picked up, and we know that Tybro has been a very proficient Malphite player from last year, and I was kind of hoping to see maybe it was that style of Karma top and Malphite support that could have came out from this. Yeah, and that would have been exciting to see. I think I would have liked to see a, a Silas ban. That was something that we saw across the, the last two seasons here is when you're going to be picking Malphite, when you're going to be picking Orn or any of these champions that have huge, huge engaged tools. Um, with AP scalings, you don't want to see Silas on the other side because he's just going to take that and ram that in your face with even more damage than what you're trying to do. And Malphite's pretty bad into Silas. You're probably going to be looking at, you know, an Arcane Comet, a little bit more, you know, lane priority in that because he can't go head to head against this Silas. And, and even team fighting can be a little bit rough. Yeah, I'm going to have to be very careful. You talked about it, Silas against these things like Orn and Malphite. Having a champion that can steal ultimates, especially from these big tanks, and he's able to build this AP full, you know, style that he is, it just becomes so scary when you're when you're a champion like the Jin, like the Seraphine, like the Karma. You know, you're not able to survive as much burst as an AP Malphite ultimate. So we're gonna have to see how they play it out here. They're gonna have to be very, very careful when it comes to these team fights. Iowa is looking to go full engage here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they have the J4 picked up again. We've already talked a bit about that. And specifically, it's it's usually used against Udyr and Olaf, right? Those are champions that get pretty big and can, can run you down. But that's all they can do is run. They don't have any movement abilities. You know, it's not like a Prowler's Claw that can dash over the side, which that'd be kind of fun to see, but we're not going to we're not gonna see that one ever picked up. I, don't, I think that's kind of a waste for some of those champions. But it'd be cool. Oh, no. Yeah, I definitely agree. It would be very, very cool. Um, how do you think objectives are going to be played here? I'm, I'm really expecting to see Iowa trying to scrap as much as they can this game. Yeah, I think we might see some, some similar things to we saw last game where we see a lot of pressure into the bot lane. I think this is a more stable matchup in the mid lane, right? You have Seraphine and Lux both trying to contest these waves. And Lux will probably do a, bit, a little bit better job in, in the team fights for trying to get some of these picks, which is... The end goal of Iowa, right? You want to get a pick, and then you want to transition that into a team fight. Just getting a nice light binding from this Lux can set up the J4 to go all in in some of these teams. And there's three members on the side of AQ that can't afford to be stunned up, right? You have that Seraphine, which is very, very squishy. You have that Jin and that Karma. So three members that, if they get tagged by any amount of, of crowd control, they're pretty much going down, right? That's huge kill pressure coming out of Misfortune. You have the J4 in the set running at you, and... Silas can kind of do the same, though I expect him to try and go for some of these flanks. I think having, you know, Grundle Jelly on, on a flanking position with a Malphite ultimate or Seraphine ultimate could be really, really deadly. And if he does go in on some of these backline members, then you might be able to one-shot them before they can do any damage. And that's kind of the other side of AQ is you have the Malphite, Olaf, and Seraphine over top with Jin providing back up. So it's, it's going to be a difficult one to see. I expect some bot lane skirmishes and maybe some fightings for these early drakes. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> and I just want to talk about the idea that Iowa here is going to have, they have the Cataclysm and they have the amount of CC when it comes to this Lux set and Silas for that bullet time to reign supreme through these team fights. And that's going to be a very, very scary thing for AQ. And they're going to have to keep an eye out on that as we are now going to be loading on to the Rift. And um, I'm glad you, you, you talked about some of that bullet time, right? Misfortune and the, the, the J4 coming through, and I think that's that's why it's actually going to be a little bit more difficult for for Iowa to find some of these these picks, and it's really going to be depending on Kodo on this Lux to find those bidings, because you don't have to step up very close for double zero for Tybro or Steven Air on these, on these long-range champions, right? You don't have to really get into the fray, so they really are depending on a few of these abilities to lock them down or, or Silas coming in but before this bullet time can erupt, so... If Obey Toppin, on the other hand, can get ahead in this matchup, there's very little that, that, that Iowa can do, to be honest. Yeah, and we are seeing the five-man maneuver right now coming through top lane <clears throat> from AQ here. Again, you can see at the top there, it is one to one This game will decide the fate for AQ. And we're going to have to see. They are trying to get to this tribe rush first. And we are actually seeing Grundle Jelly is pretty slow on the rotation. 
going to have to be very, very careful not to show themselves. Oh. <laughs> that was pretty close. Yeah, that movement speed boost might have gone right to that bush. Maybe sniff that one out. Yeah, I think I... it's pretty it's pretty standard from an Olaf invade at this point. I think everyone kind of knows that level 1 Olaf strength. Yeah, that was kind of a double take there from Grunel Jelly. I, I don't think he spotted anybody. We didn't see any of the pings come out. But I think as he walked towards the bush, he pulled back and probably thought that if they were going to try anything, it'd definitely be there. Yeah, I think that probably the right move um, from, from both sides. I always like to see that level 1 invade from Olaf. It's kind of a waste if you don't do it. Looks like junglers are going to be starting on the top side. Uh, just kind of shaking hands and moving toward the bot side of the map, which is... Some excellent analysis from, from the pair of us expecting all that action <laughs> in the bot lane. But, I mean, what? that's really all there is to it. I mean, it's a, it's a Malphite lane. It's it's a Seraphine and a, and a Lux lane. These are all just farming matchups where the rest of it is where we're going to see some spicy action here in the bot side. Already, you have uh, this set just playing in the bush and uh, Double Zero and Tybro <laughs> as well. It's like a little game of chicken. Yeah, they were just kind of waiting. They, Without knowing it, they were looking at each other. It was almost like the uh, two-sided mirrors. They were staring into each other, but they did not know. We are seeing the early wave pushing come here from the side of Iowa. <clears throat> we did see that Olaf did do topside with a leashless start, and we do have Jarvan. He is currently on Krugs. Most likely, they're both going to be looking for that full clear right now. Yeah, it looks like, a, like you said, a little bit of a full clear. J4, again, doesn't really have anywhere he's going to be going early. Uh, probably may have gone to the top side, but I think that Slyos is going to be you know, starting those those chains to just try and get some poke down onto this Malphite. And as we talked about, it's going to be that Arcane Comet. Malphite just have more lane presence. Might be able to farm a little bit more with that Q, not getting too close. Corrupting potions for both top laners. And everything's pretty standard in, in terms of room choices here. It is the press the attack uh, misfortune, but that's, that's not too special. All right, Jay, I'm going to need you to explain to me what is this Boots 4-pot start that happens with Jin? So, Jin has a lot of base damage, right? He can trade off of his, his bullets very, very effectively. Um, and you don't really need a lot of combat stats for Jin besides trading health pools. Um, because he has very low mana cost as well. So, you're just trying to trade with your fourth shot, get in people's face. You're going to do more damage they can do to you. And then use those health potions um, to, to top off as J4 is paying a little visit to the bot lane here. And uh, Grundle's getting pretty low on the top side as well. But actually, J4 is going to be the one caught. And he does have the flag and drag if he needs to go over the wall, which he will. Yeah, kind of close encounters here. Top lane has been a back and forth of these health pools. Both of them touching about 300 HP using the corrupting potion as well as the biscuits. They did take inspiration as their secondary runes here. And they are just going to try to regen up in these lane matchups. And we do see Grunge Jelly going for the early back. Yep. Well, nothing too special going on here. So, yeah, it is really just about the out-sustain game for Jen. He has that utility in his kit. And J4, again, coming to the bot side of the map. They need to be careful. Tybro might have to flash away from this. Even just a face break to pull through flag and drag coming in. But Tybro does end up flashing away. But good damage being traded back onto this misfortunate. Now, double zero has to flash. But teleport coming in from both sides. Steven here trying to get the kill over here. But look at this. Kodo is now behind three members. Flag and drag coming over onto Fate's Call. But I'll fight. Want to fight before level six? That's first blood going over to Iowa. Yeah, that was four teleports coming out right there in bot lane. You talked about it. They are looking for these spicy plays here, trying to get one side ahead, and that is going to be a kill going on to Jarvan here. PGR does walk up, but he's going to get chunked out by the misfortune. Make it rain as well as the set, and that is going to just be a series of unfortunate events yet again for AQ. But the kills do go on to the tank Jarvan and the tank set right now. Yeah, and that set started his life out in that bush, kind of finished his double zero in that bush as well, so he didn't know what was going on. Now Obi Toppin finding two members in the jungle, but he gets bursted as that Silas takes him down. Yeah, he thought he was going to be able to handle it, but there wasn't enough for Steven Eater to come up and roam. He was being pushed in, his health is low, mana was low, and it's just a rough start right now for AQ. That was... Whew. That damage coming out from that Lux and Silas. The, the, just that Kingslayer able to turn things around, right? As oh, that J4 is getting very, very low. My, mm -hmm. Don't want to see another jungler go down to these wolves. 
all these jungle camps getting buffed with more health and more damage. It's just harder to take them out. So <laughs> feeling a little bit of pain in, in that one. But so far, no objectives have been really taken down quite yet. You still have that, that Drake up. It is going to be that Infernal Drake here. So we're not going to see that soul coming through. Not as much damage, not as much pop. And we'll have to see as the game transitions on over here. But... In the end, I just think that was a huge mistake from, from AQ, from Fate's Call, right? There's no reason for your Malphite to TP into a fight without your ultimate, as now Silas hits level 6 first, and he's going to use that that jump on to Fate's Call, who didn't really take that much damage, as there's not really any damage items picked up. But actually, that Kingslayer and that passive from Silas is enough to take him down. That's now 0-2 for Fate's Call yet again on this Malphite. Yeah, you saw the Conqueror it hit the 12 stacks, and Silas was just able to burst him down straight from 400 health it took him so long to get him there but once that conqueror procs it is just a mass murder amount of damage this is again some some of the worst case scenario for for this game for aq right you have that silas getting ahead in this matchup it has so many good ultimates to steal away even that karma ultimate's not too bad right it's it's a really short cooldown so you can take that multiple times it, it, as you get later into the game but He's just going to be running over Fate's Call in this match. We already said that was really bad as the Hex Flash comes going on to Tybro. Hasn't been rooted up yet. Waiting to get two members on with an excellent face breaker. You have Obi Toppin trying to flash in, trade one back as Tybro goes down. Hopefully this set will be soon to vol as he's just going to be giving that one over. It's double zero. They're able to get the trade back, which is very, very well done there for AQ. <clears throat> they have to be so careful. This set is running Phase Rush and did pick up the Swifty Boots right away. We now have this big wave right now. Fate's Call is down a bit in CS. This game is looking a little bleak, but I think AQ here, they're trying to pull back as much as they can. Try to get their, you know, their hands on the stream wheel once again. And still... We did see that the Infernal Drake went down for Iowa, and the next one's going to be Cloud. So we are guaranteed at least Mountain Soul or Ocean Drake Soul for this game. Both very, very good win cons for either team. Yeah, and the silver lining is yet again that kill went over to the set, over to that tank. So I'm not, it's it's okay. I mean, honestly, having the set with uh, with more gold, more movement, and, and able to get around the map and be more tankier actually isn't too bad as Obi Toppin is being spotted out here doesn't quite have that Ragnarok. He's just being stunned up and taken down. That Silas picking up his third kill of the match. And again, this is just looking darker and darker for AQ as uh, the Seraphine has to, to run all the way along the long side as J4 and Seth just be running between two turrets. Four members going on to Stevenator here. The Encore being stolen away. Tybro is in the pit. Flash over Encore goes wide. Tybro, I don't think he has a way out of this one as the light banding lands. The chains will soon follow and Grundle Jelly down on a rampage. Four, zero, and one on this Silas. And it's not over yet as the Cataclysm comes down. So does the bullet time. And Dingo Bingus is going to pick one up for himself. Iowa is moving as a full five-man unit. It's not even 10 minutes in the game, and they now have eight kills, and they have so much pressure in this game. And I just feel like Iowa just has AQ's number, man. They just <clears throat> started off with drafting phase. They banned away, you know, pretty much three three champions that Cyber would have liked to play. He's put on this Karma, and so far it's not as effective as, you know, his Alistar, even his Leona was not just... Fate Skull being put over to this Malphite win. Before, it just seemed like all he was playing was ranged champion. So Iowa might have just found that, that puzzle piece that they needed to take out AQ in this match. Mm -hmm. Silas is huge in this game. And it's going to be so hard for, for AQ to find that perfect team fight. Yeah, already 4-1. Has the Phoenix Codex. Has the Boots of Lucidity. He's just able to abuse Fate's Call in this lane. And his TP is coming up as Dragon does have a two-minute timer on it right now. AQ is going to have to pull the rabbit out of the hat here, you know? Show us the magic trick, and it, we're just going to have to believe that they're able to pull this back. Yeah, and uh, you might not see, you know, this, this Cloud Drake being contested, but honestly, that would feel really, really good for Iowa. Having more ultimate abilities on a Cataclysm, on, on that Silas... Um, it's going to be feeling really, really nice, and you already get, you know, pretty much ultimate cooldown reduction for that Lux. He's able to just ult, like, every 15 seconds. It just becomes ridiculous, and 
It's just going to allow them to stack that Drake even more. As I think AQ just needs to be a little bit more patient here. Instead, Tyro's going to be flashing on, gets the root onto MF, who flashes away. Now the Deadly Force is going to root him up, but they just don't have the damage or the positioning to follow that one up. They might look for a dive. You do have the Olaf waiting around, but that Lux is in the river as well as Fate's Call getting very, very low. And Grendel's Jelly might decide to dive him on the top side. Yeah, <clears throat> only as the Merc treads against now, the Lost Chapter is built for Silas. This Malphite's not able to build health just yet, and he is just getting abused right now in this lane matchup. But we are seeing AQ is trying to get pressure and try to get vision onto this objective. That is going to be the Silas with the Malphite all unstoppable and Cataclysm coming out from Jarvan. And that is going to be Fate's Call picked up for uh, Dingle Bingus. And we are seeing a skirmish here in bot lane. Set's going to do what he can, try to live here, and that is going to possibly be the kill taken. Oh, it is stolen by Tybro. Not exactly what you want to see, but the Rift Herald has dropped top lane, and they are investing so much into the Silas now. That double knockup, right? You have that, that ultimate coming out from the Silas, and then you have the flag and drag for J4, and just doesn't allow Fate's Call to get to move an inch here as now AQ has some prime positioning on this Drake. They want to burn this one down as fast as they can before that J4 can arrive. But that bullet time is up for that misfortune. Multiple members are pretty low. This just might be a little bit of a suicide attempt here. Deadly Force goes by TP coming out for Iowa here, but it's actually interrupted by Fate's call. The dragon goes down over to AQ. We'll see if they can get out of this one. Obi Top waiting for his flash cooldown to go up. The Encore actually landing here, being charmed around. Obi Top had tried to get one in, but Kodo in the end is going to be taking him down. Something that was so unfortunate about that, that Encore does charm a target, meaning they're going to take the easiest path towards you. Unfortunately, that also means they're going to have to walk around the wall, and they were just walking away from the Karma. They couldn't get any other assistance. They were so close. One Mantra Q from Karma, and that fight looks way different. But again, that charm, they just walked around the wall. And it looks so good at first. You get like that that four-man Encore ultimate charming them out. And then they just like slowly walk the other way. And you're just like, oh, darn. That's that's kind of a dunzo play for that. As the light blinding does land onto Steven here. He's just getting poked out on this pick. But you know, he's trading back with those high notes. So Seraphine kind of kind of mute in this game, to be honest. Like Lux is going to be providing a little bit more potential as the, the beats do land onto Silas, but he took that Encore away. And now that Seraphine has to zoom out of there. It looks like he's actually going for the Moonstone build as well. So double Moonstones coming out from the side of AQ. We'll see if they're lacking damage as it's going to be a full tank Malphite and they don't really have any AP threats. So the Showstopper comes through onto Steven here. He's taken down by the set yet again and Obi Top is sure to follow, but the dive is going to trade one back as the set goes down. Yeah, that's a two for one trade in favor of Iowa, and they're just going to start melting down <clears throat> this mid lane turret. Tybro here on the Karma trying his best to balance it out, but that is just going to be plates going over to Iowa. And this is just dire for AQ, to, to be honest. I mean, really, when you're, you're running two supportive builds, you're counting on those builds to, to come online. Way before the enemy team, like they're, they're so cheap, you know, you talked about the 2,500 gold point, and that's much less gold than, than any of the other mythics, but when you're behind, they're hitting those mythics before or at the same pace of those moonstones, they're going to be just being out damaging you. They're going to be ahead in tempo, you can already see there's such a huge gold lead, you're, you're hitting, you know, 6,000 gold before 15 minutes, 3 to 12, they have... You know, even Drake's, but it, but in the end, I'd say that Infernal Drake is, is worth more, and it's just looking bleak for AQ in this game. Yeah, and we are seeing it's an Ocean Soul game. <clears throat> now, the chances of us getting to that Ocean Soul are kind of closing slowly, but AQ's going to have to be very careful with their positioning here. They're trying to just find any way they can back into this game, moving four members down here to bot lane trying to catch out this set and this misfortune but we do see silas is now down here coming through bot dry brush see steven you're trying to make that play just sit in the bush you have really great long range engage right that encore actually bounce <clears throat> excuse me bounces um once you hit one member you just reset that length cooldown so you can throw it through your own teammates onto enemy champions and just keeps going and going and going lovely little ability there but it's not going to amount to much as uh, again aq is just going to be trying to weather the storm a little bit over top of being poked out by this looks actually that does land as the ultimate comes through but the silas is here as well 
and he's just going to be taken down again. And Silas602 has that Lee Andres completed. Again, has that Phoenix Codex and Ionia boots. And that's so much ability haste, man. Those those abilities can be up like every few seconds. Yeah. <clears throat> It is looking real tough right now. Silas does have the Leandri's Torment. Good amount of mana. Good amount of sustain with that Kingslayer. And we are just seeing Io right now. Kind of setting up for Dragon. We're getting the resets off right now. They still have a minute. And we do see the Turbo Camp Tank picked up for the set here. That is five Mythics to four at the moment. Yep, Gale Force for Misfortune, Chem Tank have the Ludens over here for this Lux. Even the uh, the Iron Soul right there, I believe, or whichever, Sunfire. Sunfire got changed a few times. Still not not quite 100% confident on these new items. There's so many different things, everyone's being changed and all many different item builds. Uh, Tybro is going to be in the river, but just shields himself up and runs away and you can see like we talked about that it's now sitting at two items and fate skull doesn't even have a completed first item at this point in the game but they do have their ultimates they do have some great combat power and maybe that encore lands on multiple members and they finally run into the team as the resident beep does move over but he's able to run away with the flag and drag now this set is in the back line he's going to be trying to stun them up actually does get that face breaker and the showstopper coming through as tybro goes down in the beginning but obitop is in the back line trying to do what he can but he just doesn't have the items quite yet as the double kill goes over to this misfortune now two members on the side of aq on the other side of the fight fate's call is here but is able to use that ultimate only on one member and he gets taken down by the set now four three and five and it looks like the misfortune is the support in this game is double zero is going to be trying to back away in the bush yeah, and you can just watch the numbers right after that team fight happened you know after the combat delay you just saw all of the bounty bounties coming from mid bot and support onto iowa <clears throat> and that is going to be ocean dragon going over we still have two drakes for soul point on the side of iowa but they are able to just push down these turrets it is about an 8k gold lead now by 17 and a half minutes. And AQ is just kind of missing the mark on some of these team fights. That was a very late teleport coming out of Fate's Call here and only landing the unstoppable on one member of Iowa. Yeah, and let's watch at the end of that fight. That Silas King Slayer just like totally took down <laughs> that, that Jin. And even though he had really low health, that Silas health pool just went up. Like 100% and my mouth, my jaw just dropped. It's just absolutely disgusting. You can just see the power. Uh, some of these champions went ahead, just feel impossible to play against. Yeah, Grundle Jelly is just showing how much of a snowball effect can be had when you play these champions, these high risk, high reward champions like Gangplank, like Silas. And he's, he's just showing AQ a time, a very, very bad time right now. Look at, looking rough for, for Fate's Call here. Doesn't really have a, a place right now in this as the in this game as he doesn't really have the tanky stats to withhold against the damage coming through from Iowa as they might be trying to look a pick onto this misfortune. But he has both summoners and Gale Force opening top and does have the Gore Drinker completed. That's not going to really help lock down anything as now Grendel Jelly is wrapping around here. And remember, there's no tower here. Multiple members are coming around for, for Iowa as the ultimates come out from both of them. It looks like... Obi Top is going to be the first one to fall. They're trying to chase over to Fate's Calls. The Face Breaker doesn't land. He's able to run away. Yeah. <clears throat> Obi Top and drop in here. And we are seeing three members right now on the bot side turret, tier two. And we are now seeing PJR and Tybro. They are having to be very careful as they maneuver through their top jungle. They don't have any mid lane tier one turret to keep them safe. And this Silas, Jarvan, and Lux combo are just going to go for this tier 2 turret, and they do drop the Herald. And this is the, the other side of the coin with some of these picks like Olaf and Malphite, because they're really good when ahead, but from behind, they just feel so useless. Useless to play and useless to these team fights, because Olaf doesn't really bring anything to the table besides damage, right? He's not that tanky. He just wants to get in people's face and brawl out, but if any enemy team is ahead of you, you just end up going down and going 1-7, so it feels really, really bad for Obi Toppin, as now they're trying to trade back. That They're coming through. The Showstopper does land on Obi Toppin, but they might be able to take down this set. You have Stevenator on the side trying to get some Encores. It is able to flash away. The Kingslayer isn't able to finish them off, but AQ members are so low. They have to be very, very careful with the rest of the Siege coming out of Iowa. 
Yeah, and that is going to be the side of Iowa onto the inhibitor right now. PGR is going to drop as Dingle Bingus was just on the outside of that turret range. That is going to be mid inhibitor dropping at 2025 there. This is going to be very rough. That's going to create a lot of pressure going into the AQ base as there is a two minute timer right now on the next ocean drag. And we are going to most likely be seeing recalls coming out from the side of Iowa. But AQ is kind of moving into their topside jungle. They're going to be very careful. They're going to get caught here. <coughs> Dingle yeah, Biggest. guy was actually trying to set up a bait here, but Dingle Biggest goes down. Seraphine will fall on the other side for AQ, but a big ultimate coming out of the Silas and now the Malphite as well. But guess which one uses it better? It's the Silas as Fate Skull is going to go down to Grundle Jelly, and now they might just be looking to end the game, just running down to mid lane. There's very little that AQ can do to stop them. Iowa is just on a roll this game, and instead they're going to be reset it, giving AQ a little bit of chance to breathe. Yeah, so much pressure right now. 12k gold lead, 21-30, and we are seeing the Ocean Drag in 50 seconds, and it's going to be so hard for AQ to contest this as well if, if they move on to the Baron afterwards. They have lanes pushing in mid and bot right now. The top lane, their only source of movement. But AQ is just stuck and bottlenecked in their base. It looks like this set's going to be trying to get some vision down onto this Baron. They don't really need it at this point. The rest of your team is so far ahead. You know, 12k up on, on, this, on this side is just insane. And, and Obi Top is going to be moving toward the top side. They're trying to catch out... This set here, but just as the blast cone just moves over as multiple members are... It looks like they're actually rotating over to the Baron. They just want to end the game at this point. They don't need to stack some of these drakes. They know they have the lead, and they just want to be pushing it as Tybro is clearing out these wards. But all the members for Iowa are in at this point. They have to be very, very careful. This Silas is huge. The chains land onto the Seraphine. The ultimate coming down from Lexi's to be locked down. Encore straight back. But that's a huge shutdown onto the Silas. Cataclysm coming through. Obi Top and going down as Koto is picking up his fourth kill of the game. Dingle Bingus has slain Steven here. The bullet time coming up just to finish off a few members. That's a double kill for I am the awesome 10 and now they're teleporting into the base ac yeah alexis is able to just get in in there it looks so good at the start of that fight silas did go in with the chains went on to seraphine and they miss as much as they could seraphine did get the encore onto silas but at the end of the day they just did not have enough damage to get through this jarvan too much shielding coming out from the side of Lux, and that is just going to be an ace to finish out this game. 629, 34.7k gold to 47.7k. Tybro trying his best and almost dropping. I am awesome 10, but that is going to be the series for today. University of Iowa taking down Aquinas College. Over here in a best of three, AQ took the first game, but Iowa were coming back and took down the last two. And great game from both members. We got to see a lot of mastery from both sides. And Gruntle Jelly just popping off in the game. And I know I am awesome 10 went 9, 0, and 10 at the end of that game. But it really felt like Grundle was just all over the map. Yeah, for sure. If I had to get my, my MVP of the series, they would have to go to Grundle Jelly. Absolutely showing a masterclass performance on this Silas, on this Gangplank, and being such a pivotal player in this series. But that does unfortunately drop us now for AQ to 3-2 in C-Law. Yeah, if that means we won't be moving on to the playoffs, but we'll still be competing. We do have our Friday night league over, you know, at Phoenix Rising. We'll still be in Silo. We're probably not going to be dropping out of this league. It's always great to represent your program, get more practice in, and, and build on some of these players. They definitely have the right idea. I know there was a little, uh, a, a little um, mess ups here with, with some of the rosters and, and working things out in the end, but we will come back swinging. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> and... Unless there's anything else for you to say there, Jay, I do believe that is the end for us today. Yep, that's going to close out our stream for tonight. Again, University of Iowa take down AQ College, or a AQ Esports Aquinas College. And thankful to be here, thankful to have you, Armor Class, and we will see you guys next time. Yep, lovely to be here. Have a good night, everybody.